What would happen if Deathstroke decided he was too weak to fight the Teen Titans, so he became a speedster by stealing the power of the Flash? This is the full story series here at Comic Story. Comic Story is a channel on YouTube where we take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites so that I can read them dramatically back to you. And today we're going to be bringing you a full story. You see, comic books come out with about 20 pages on a monthly basis, which normally leads to comic books taking almost a year to give you a full storyline. That turns into us creating videos over the course of multiple months to tell you what's going on in that comic book. And when they're all done, we put them together in a full story so that you get an hour to two hours version of a movie almost. All the comic book story arcs in one big city. Teen Titans is a series that is hugely popular, and in 2016 it restarted with Teen Titans Rebirth, a brand new Teen Titans team. And what we got in that Teen Titans team was an Aqualad arc and a Deathstroke arc. And today we're going to bring those videos together to give you the Deathstroke Saga slash arc. That's what's going on in today's full story. You're also going to find out about Aqualad. And with that note, we're going to be starting our full story. I hope you guys enjoy. Now with the Titans Tower built, Damien looks to the future to see where this new group of teen superheroes will go. As Damien watches the sea from the Titans Tower, he listens to the news reports on the escape of over 50 prisoners who broke out of maximum security prison facilities and have yet to be found. However, in other news, shark attacks are up. Suddenly a pelican swoops in squawking, and then Engar transforms telling him that if he didn't know, that was pelican for it's time for lunch. Damien tells him that sneaking up on him could lead to deadly consequences, so he may want to rethink think before doing that again. Gar asks, what is he doing here anyway? Coming up with a master plan for toilet papering the Justice League Tower? And Damien tells him that he's just playing. Before Gar can even finish asking playing what, Goliath shoots out of the water, dropping a large stick, and he begins to lick Gar. As the two head back inside, Gar asks, why does he keep that obnoxious bat wookie thing around? To which Damien asks, where does this costume go when he transforms? Both excellent questions, Gar responds. Once inside, Gar serves up his mouth-watering platter of tofu for lunch, and Wally says that life is not worth living without double bacon cheeseburgers. Gar changes into a cow, telling him that that's like cannibalism, dude, and Raven asks Wally if he can do that thing. And in seconds, Wally runs out, and then he comes back with pizzas, shouting that Central City's finest pies are here. There's even a veggie one for Gar. And just as everyone sits down to eat, the security alarms begin to go off, and the island begins to go into full combat mode. Everyone runs outside, and just then, Damien shouts, Titans go? And that's when he sees the reporter from the news telling him that Mr. Logan said to be here for an interview at 1 o'clock. Gar shrugs, stating, Oopsie, kind of forgot to tell you guys about that one. <laughs> And while Gar goes to show the reporter around the base, over in New Mexico, Jackson Hyde plays with the water from his fish tank as his mother yells at him. She storms into his room asking how many times does she have to tell him he can't do that, not even with the door closed and the blind shut. He was already born with marks on his arms that people think are tattoos. Now he's bleaching his hair, so why does he try so hard to be different? As Jackson holds up a ball of water with fish in it, he says that he's not trying, he is different. Back over at Titan's Tower, Gar's interview is about to finish when suddenly the reporter is grabbed and pulled underwater. Later that night in New Mexico, Jackson sits out with his boyfriend, telling him that he really should just tell his father the truth about them so that they can stop trying to hide like this. Kenny says that it's not really that simple. His dad is one of the good old boys. Big belt buckle and American flag bumper sticker. Jackson then wraps his arm around Kenny, telling him, Look, there's a video that went viral about the Teen Titans. He can't stop imagining what it must be like for them, living on their own, no one telling them how to live their lives. He opens up a water bottle, saying that he wants to show him something. Just like when they first got together and he would sing a country song for him. Just stay for this. The markings on Jackson's arms begin to glow, and the water flows from the bottle and swirls around Kenny, who begins to scream. He smacks the bottle, telling him to stop. What the hell is this? And Jackson tells him that it's okay. He's just like the Teen Titans. And Kenny walks away, telling him that he's had enough of this hiding. It's time for them to go their separate ways. So with that, Jackson packed up his belongings and headed off to San Francisco to tell himself that he needs to understand who he is. He needs to stop hiding himself away. And he needs to start where there are new beginnings, where he may belong. Meanwhile, back with the Titans, Gar asks how does he look in his otter form, and Damien says that he looks like bait. Gar then says that he deserves that. He was the one who brought the reporter into their base, and she disappeared on his watch. Raven reports that she's not picked up anything, and Starfire says that she circled the Bay Area twice and found nothing. Damien tells everyone to just keep an eye out, and Gar heads back into the water to look around. Just as he looks down towards the sea floor, he sees a giant thing swimming by fast. Gar changes into a fish, and he jumps out of the water, shouting, Guys! I think we're gonna need a bigger boat! And that's when King Shark jumps 
jumps out of the water, destroying Damien's Titan boat. While King Shark makes his way towards everyone, Damien shouts that this guy is a killing machine. But this is what they were trained for. Begin Maneuver X! Wally then asks, which one is that? The one where I run in circles making a whirlpool or the one where I twirl my arms to make a cyclone? Raven tells him that it doesn't take a mind reader to sense that Damien is going to be so mad. King Shark punches Damien and Starfire catches him. And he shouts that she wasn't supposed to be there, she was supposed to be over there. Didn't anyone study the playbook that he gave him? King Shark then escapes back into the waters and swims over to his hideout underneath Alcatraz. Once inside, he tells the escaped prisoners that he's gotten the attention of the so-called heroes. With the reporter's help, soon they will have the attention of all of the air breathers. So let the feeding frenzy begin. Back at the Titan's Tower, Damien begins to prepare for the next battle when a voice calls out, ahem, yeah, hi. Everyone turns back to see Jackson, and Damien runs over asking how did he get past their security? He should have been shocked, missiled, trapped, doored at least a dozen times. Jackson points at Goliath, stating, actually, the big furry thing let me in. Before Damien can even yell at Goliath, Jackson tells him not to be mad at him, he just didn't know where else to go. His name is Jackson Hyde, and he was kind of hoping that they could help him figure out a few things. So he came for an audition? Damien walks past him, telling him, not a chance. And Jackson says that he can speak with water, he can move it with his mind, and, and Damien stops him asking, and what, squirt gun? You want to come play in our clubhouse? He goes on saying that this team will be the ground version of the Watchtower team. Everyone has been recruited for a specific reason, so bottom line is, he wouldn't fit in. Jackson begins to head out, saying that if he doesn't belong here, he won't belong anywhere. While everyone says that, that was a bit harsh of him, Damien tells everyone that he's pinpointed King Shark's base, so they gotta go. Suddenly the monitors change and everyone sees the reporter from before announcing that she is broadcasting from the Alcatraz Island with an exclusive interview with... But King Shark interrupts her shouting, King Shark, and I have a message for everyone. The air breathers damned these prisoners in their previous life, so it is I who has given them a second chance. My soldiers are more evolved, outfitted with gills, claws, and teeth. And within moments, Gar bursts through the prison walls, while everyone follows Gar in, he shouts, Newsflash, we're here to kick your butt. Everyone quickly begins to fight off the shark prisoners, while Starfire tells the human prisoners that she believes the human expression for this is, run for your lives. Wally begins to run with Raven on his back, and as he passes by some people, Raven touches and starts to teleport people away. King Shark begins to run back outside, and as he leaps into the water, Damien throws a battering at him and pulls him back in. King Shark grabs the wire around him, flinging Damien over to him, and he grabs him, telling him that he got himself a minnow. But before King Shark can sink his teeth into Damien, water begins to rise and knock the two of them down. And Jackson asks if he really just did that. Damien shouts for him to get away! He's just gonna get himself killed! But with the wire still wrapped around King Shark, he jumps into the water, pulling Damien with him. Just as King Shark gets to the depths that would crush a normal human bone, Jackson swims down with a watery blade, thinking, yeah, I could die, but it's time to use this power for good. Jackson slashes away at King Shark's chest, and he quickly grabs Damien, swimming back up. However, there's one thing that Jackson needed. Air! He quickly gasps, but rather than drowning in water, he breathes it. As Jackson rides the water, carrying Damien out, he tells himself, Yeah, this is where I belong. Later that night in the Titan's Tower, Damien calls out to Jackson, telling him that they need to talk. Jackson says, yeah, he knows, he sucks, and he should just go home, right? And Damien says that now that the shark mutants have been rounded up and sent to Star Labs for questions, they couldn't find King Shark. So he's come here to give him this, and he tosses him a box. Jackson pulls out a uniform, and Damien says that he was working on a Hydra suit for himself, so it might be a little tight. Jackson asks if this means that he can stay with the Teen Titans, and Damien tells him that it's just a costume, so don't get too comfortable. Meanwhile, back over at the Nemo outpost, Blackjack asks King Shark if he really thought it would be wise to broadcast himself like that. But as they talk, a voice interrupts them and asks King Shark to tell him more about this boy, the one who speaks to water. King Shark looks over at the voice and tells him that he thought he was dead, and Black Manta steps out telling him, I want to hear everything about him. In the center of the city, Ravager has defeated all of the Titans and has pinned Robin to the ground. Donna yells out that Ravager is so fast he's unstoppable, and he sneers, telling her, That's right, I've made me faster, stronger! Now nothing can stop the Ravager! I'm practically invincible! But as he's gloating, he reels back in pain, and the Titans watch him hit the ground. Omen yells out that it's his heart, his heart is failing, and as he dies, there on the streets, Deathstroke comes running out of the woodwork, calling out for Grant. He runs over to Ravager, holding him in his arms, asking, What did you do? And Ravager looks at Deathstroke. Deathstroke, did I get them? Did I kill the Titans? And as he dies, Deathstroke holds him close. Yes, 
You got them all. He picks up his son in his arms and he tells the Titans, My son died here because of you, and someday soon, you'll all pay for that. Which now brings us to the current day with Deathstroke waking up out of costume from a surgery in which his eyesight was restored. That's the recent storyline for Deathstroke. He was rendered blind and now that's been resolved. Wintergreen tells him that his daughter Rose is in stable condition and Jericho is in rehab, but Grant is still dead. Deathstroke looks at Wintergreen and he tells him, You kept calling out Grant in your sleep. Meanwhile, Wally and the Titans are fighting against an enemy when Wally finds himself out of place and out of time. He has no idea where he is, and someone calls out, What's your name? Wally tells him, I'm Wally West and I'm the fastest man alive. But he quickly wonders why he answered whatever that voice was. The voice tells him to keep running. And while he tries to argue, he's shocked by a device on his wrists and ankles. Wally continues to run asking, Who are you? How did you swipe me in broad daylight with the Titans around? And the voice continues, 300 miles per hour. Wally thinks about it. I know that voice. It's Deathstroke. He kidnapped me. And Deathstroke asks him, Tell me about the Titans. Wally continues, The Titans were formed in secret to prove to our mentors that STOP MAKING ME DO THAT! And Deathstroke tells him, 500 miles an hour. You vanished. Where have you been? Abracadabra threw me into the time stream, but you came back. I escaped from it. The Flash pulled me out, but I remember a different world. That's how I know you. Something or someone has changed history. Who? I don't know! I don't know! Halt treadmill. Wally West, I have a deal for you. You were there when the Ravager died. Yeah, that was years ago. The Titans killed my son. It wasn't us, Deathstroke. Hive's powers are too much for him. His heart couldn't take it. I tried to save him, I tried. But I wasn't fast enough. Slade turns his head as he remembers the scene. Wally is strapped into another machine as he asks him. Speed bends time. You and the other Flashes can time travel, right? Yes, but we won't because... But it's too late. Slade turns on the machine and Wally begins to vibrate uncontrollably. Slade, stop! Don't do it! I lost everything when I returned and I struggle with the idea that I can go back and fix it. But I don't, because you have to keep moving forward! Wally shouts as he breaks out of the machine, tackling Deathstroke. Slade ducks and dodges as Wally moves super fast trying to get him. But when he finally pins Deathstroke to a wall, Deathstroke offers him a proposal. Wally, help me bring my son back and I will stop being Deathstroke forever. No more costume. No more contracts, no more killing. Save one life, and you save thousands. Wally's eyes go wide as he considers the offer, but then he turns away. I'm sorry, Slade. I can't do that. Slade pushes a button. I figured. That's why I have a backup plan. And behind the wall is the younger Wally West that was created in this new timeline. And he yells at the original Wally. Your name's Wally West? How can you be Wally West when I'm Wally West? Now to attempt to keep things from getting confusing, we're going to refer to the original Wally West as Flash from this point on. The new Wally West will be Wally West. And for a short version of why there are two Wally Wests, well, one was introduced as a replacement during the New 52, but the original Wally West was recently brought back in the DC Rebirth. They're actually making this a plot point in DC Rebirth, as you can see. But if you're interested in his return, I will link DC Rebirth down below. Flash turns to Wally. Do not trust this man, he's Deathstroke. And Deathstroke responds by shocking Flash and knocking him out. He then removes his helmet, telling Wally that together they can fix what's broken. He just has to trust him. This is all to bring back his son and stop the villain known as Deathstroke. Let him be slayed with his son Grant. And Wally, not knowing the horror that is Deathstroke, as he is a new superhero on the scene, begins to consider it. Meanwhile, back at the Titan headquarters, their screen pops on, and Damien tells the Titans to meet the Teen Titans on the roof. Both of them are missing a speedster, and they need to figure this out. Both teams arrive to the rooftop, and Damien turns to Nightwing. You're a traitor! Later. Since this isn't a smart way to begin a discussion, Donna grabs Damien and both teams get ready to defend their own. But as Nightwing holds his hand up, Robin's right. I made a deal with Deathstroke. Let's not fight. I promise I'll explain it later, but first we need to figure this out. If Deathstroke has both of our speedsters, time is the key. Back with Deathstroke, he asks Wally to run with him, allow him to show him his history. He brings Wally to the hospital bed that Rose, his daughter, is in, to the rehab center that his son Joseph is in, and to the grave of his son Grant. He explains that it started with Grant, but if they can save Grant, they can save Slade's family. And if Wally agrees to help, it'll end Deathstroke forever. But Deathstroke informs him, You already did when you ran with me, Wally. You've already helped me. Meanwhile, the Teen Titans and the Titans move forward because of a tracker that Damien placed onto Wally. The Teen Titans were a little weirded out to discover that Damien has trackers in all of them, but it apparently has now paid off. As they enter the hideout, they find the Flash unconscious, and they wake him up. As he wakes up, he shouts, We have no time! We have to stop Slade! And that's when Slade runs into the room with a coca goom He informs them as he stands in front of a defeated Wally that the Speed Force is now coursing through his icon suit. I have all the time in the world. Slade Wilson, a.k.a. 
Deathstroke now has Speed Force based powers by draining Wally West of his powers with the Icon suit when Wally ran with him. Slade runs off with a goom, and Flash gives a chase. Leave me alone, Flash. I mean you no harm. The deal is still in place. Deal? What are you talking about? As they get faster and faster, Slade explains that he stored the energy of Wally West to give him this speed. And as for the deal, well, he made that with someone else. A long time ago, Dick Grayson rode up to where Deathstroke was, and he was shot up by an onslaught of rubber bullets. Deathstroke had just learned that he had a daughter named Rose, and he knew that she would need care and training, so he made an arrangement with Dick Grayson. If Dick Grayson and the Titans could train Rose to have the morale and the values of a hero, he wouldn't kill any of them. The Titans would be off the table. Deathstroke and Flash run at increasing speeds through the snow-filled plains until Deathstroke stops with a WOOM! Your speed is your singular advantage, Flash. And when facing someone as fast as you, the playing field is leveled. Deathstroke is ready to draw his sword. Here, in bullet time, we're the same. Two men about to fight it out. I'm a trained killer, but what are you if you aren't the fastest man alive, Flash? Leave me to what I want to do. Flash thinks about it, and he runs away. As Deathstroke watches him, he comments, Yeah, I thought so. The Titans and the Teen Titans are trying to figure out what to do while Damien lays into Wally about giving his powers to a killer. Meanwhile, Flash has a plan and he runs to Jericho, the other son of Deathstroke, to ask for help. Jericho has an odd assortment of powers, from telepathy to being able to control others. But after asking him why Slade is trying to do this, Jericho explains that Slade will never accept the death of Grant. Nightwing then calls up the Flash, telling him that they have a plan and everyone needs to meet at the site of Grant's death. So Flash brings Jericho along for the ride. Elsewhere in the time stream, Grant is running, trying to get ready to fight the Titans when Deathstroke appears in front of him, and he takes his mask off, hugging his son. Finally, and at last. But once Grant realizes that Slade is his hero, Deathstroke, he freaks out. Slade was a horrible father who treated his kids like dirt to make them manly men. Slade tries to talk him out of his actions, telling him that they do not need to fight, they can become a family again. And Grant yells at him that he'll prove his worth! He has the powers now gifted to him by Hive! He'll defeat the Titans! And Slade knocks him out. Just because he wants to be a dad again doesn't mean that he suddenly gained patience. Crap, this didn't go any better than my first two attempts at correcting the timeline. I'll just go farther back into the timeline and fix this even earlier. And crack a goom! He runs off again. Back in the current day, the Teen Titans and the Titans are now arriving at the location that Grant died. And with that, Flash and Jericho arrive. Jericho explains that he is Grant Wilson's brother. He has Slade Wilson's other son. And Nightwing asks Flash the status on Deathstroke, and Jericho chimes in, informing them all that Slade is currently in the time stream trying to alter things. Meanwhile, with all of the confusion going on and Damien being rather pissed off that Wally let Deathstroke gain Speed Force powers, Wally was left behind, and Jackson Hyde, Aqualad, was just forgotten about. Wally tries to call up Barry to get him involved and ask for help, but he ends up just getting his voicemail. He stands there defeated, having given up his powers and possibly doomed the entire universe to a trained assassin running through the time stream, and Jackson Hyde blocks the water from raining on him before apologizing for being chatty. This is his first Universal Crisis. Back with the teams, using the powers of the Flash and Jericho, they begin to link everyone together and they create a time vortex, running through time hoping to warn their younger selves of the conflict and not alter things too heavily. As the lightning of the Speed Force and time travel course through the sky, the Titans and the Teen Titans meet Meet the original Teen Titans, the younger versions of the Titans. Nightwing warns their younger selves that they are friends and they are trying to stop a killer. But this original team doesn't know about Deathstroke yet, and that's when Damien steps forward. He pushes Nightwing aside, asking the original Robin where Ravager went. They need to find him first. Robin tells him that Ravager vanished and they were about to give chase. Damien tells him, we'll help. And then he slaps the original Kid Flash in the chest, stopping his heart! Flash of the current day begins to see himself fading out of existence as his younger self is dying. But Flash of the future realizes exactly what Damien is doing. He just cut off the Speed Force connection to Wally West and the new Wally West, which in turn cuts off Deathstroke's connection to the Speed Force. Damien starts to hurl flashbangs at the original Titans to get them off of the case, explaining that the Stone Palm technique will stop Wally West's heart temporarily. And at that moment, a slate is once again trying to convince Grant to give up his powers, the time stream begins to fade before his eyes, and he slips back into the Speed Force yelling, No! No! Back with all of the Titans and the Teen Titans, Robin of the original team runs over and starts the original Kid Flash's heart back up, which jumpstarts the time stream and the Speed Force, restoring Wally West's powers in the current day and age. He instantly suits back up and quack a goom He runs off, which leaves Jackson Hyde wondering if Wally West is coming back for him or if he was just forgotten about again. The time vortex begins to fade and the Titans and the Teen Titans begin to fade back into the present day. And that's when they see Deathstroke with Speedster powers standing on top of some cars. 
telling them, You are dead! You took my son again! Beast Boy sees his powers and he asks Damien, I thought you said you cut the cord to the Speed Force. And Nightwing tells him he did. But somehow Slade is now tapping directly into the Speed Force. He doesn't need the Flash's powers anymore. Deathstroke looks at him. Yes, I'm tapping directly into it and I have the power to wipe you all out of existence. But first, I'm gonna go save my son! And crack a goom! He runs off again. Jericho falls in behind him. Pop, you have to stop this. This is crazy. And Slade ignores him. I can feel it. The power that the speedsters tap directly into. It's like nothing that I've ever felt before. Jericho tries to warn him. Pop, you're approaching light speed. But it's too late. Deathstroke is running faster than Jericho can keep up with as he shouts, I will save Grant! crack a -goom! Back at the current timeline, Flash tells everyone that it's over. Deathstroke has entered the speed force and when you enter it, there's no returning. It's the afterlife for a speedster. Everyone agrees that it is technically a win, but that's when Wally West runs over asking how they can call themselves a hero if they are going to let someone die. The argument begins. Deathstroke is a killer, and with super speed he is a threat to the entire universe. He's not dead, but he's trapped and it's better than he deserves. But Wally asks, what do we deserve when we behave like him? He runs off into the speed force to save Deathstroke. Flash yells for him to stop, telling everyone that he doesn't understand. Once he goes in, he won't know how to get out of the speed force. Nightwing stops Flash though. Don't chase him. We lost you before. We have to make sure that you can get out. We're gonna build you a rope. Lilith can link us all together and we can use that as a way to get you out. But Damien refuses, telling everyone, Deathstroke is a killer. I'm not about to support saving him. With him separated from the group, everyone else combines and Flash runs as fast as he can. He enters with all of his friends talking inside of his head, wondering if Wally even has an idea of where he is going. As he goes deeper, he begins to fear being lost again, entering with no exit and Deathstroke with the Speed Force. How insane is this? He's about to fight the greatest assassin in the world with his own powers. He already ran away from him once because he didn't know if he could do it. His fear then bounces back through the mental link and into the empathic member of the team, Raven. She screams out in fear, creating a shaky link with the Flash. And as the link is fading, Flash begins to panic about that. At that moment, Jackson Hyde leaps out of the water to see everyone in a telepathic trance and Damien standing there snapping his fingers in front of Raven. Hey. Raven! Jackson then asks, what's going on? And Damien informs him that Raven is the link holding everyone together, and she's losing the link. All of their mental states are with the Flash, and if he's lost forever, they will all be lost forever. Everyone shouts in Flash and said that they need to abort, they need to fix this, and the Flash informs them, it's too late, we're going in! Jackson tries to help Raven, but she doesn't know him, but she does know Damien. He walks forward as stubborn as ever, and he pats her on the head. There, there. Jackson is shocked. Seriously, dude? Raven, Rachel, it's me, Damien. You're safe. No one will hurt you. Not on my watch. Come on, Raven. Your friends are waiting for you. And once again, crack a goom! Wally, Flash, and Deathstroke all fall out of the Speed Force and back onto the ground from which they left. Damien draws his weapons. This leaves us where we started. Deathstroke! And he looks at him, ready to fight. But Deathstroke draws his sword. Everything. You damn kids cost me everything. But there, inside of the Speed Force, I saw things that no man should ever see. Awareness on multiple planes all at once. And now it's all gone. My link to the Speed Force, my past being fixed. Everything. But Deathstroke should die here as well. So I'm done. Deathstroke is finished. I quit. And with that, Slade walks away, ending the fight. The epilogue for this tale goes in three directions. Due to allowing Deathstroke to gain powers and almost ending the entire universe, Damien fired Wally from the Teen Titans. For the Titans, Flash now has a pacemaker from his heart being stopped at a young age, and he should never run again. And Slade? Slade feels that it's time to do his own thing. To be a hero, lead a team. Maybe a team like the Titans. In the Hyde residence in New Mexico, Jackson's mother, Lucia, frantically calls Jackson's phone over and over, hoping that he would just pick up. As she hangs up the phone from her last attempt, she watches the news and sees a report of how the Teen Titans stopped King Shark. And up there, standing with Robin and the others, is Jackson, her son. Elsewhere, Jackson makes his way down through the street and kicks the top of a fire hydrant off, creating a pillar of water. Just as he puts his hand into it, Ra's al Ghul leaps at him, asking if he really thinks that he can stand a chance against him. No one has. Jackson throws out his arm, causing the water to cover Roz, telling him, maybe I was a no one, but now I'm a little determined to make a splash. With water filling up Roz's lungs, Damien shouts out, no, 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 don't kill him, detain him. Then the surrounding area begins to fade away and Damien walks into the training simulator stating, we don't kill. This just shows how vulnerable you really are. Damien goes on telling him that Kid Flash was vulnerable too and Deathstroke took advantage of that. Because of it, it put the team in danger, which is something that won't happen again. 
Damien then places his hand over a pack, stating that hydrokinesis is sloppy at best. This bladder unit should help. Jackson picks up the backpack, telling him that can they not call it a bladder unit? As Jackson pulls the two hilts from his back, he creates two swords made out of water. And Damien tells him, you can get creative, but ideally you won't ever have to use it. It could become just a crutch. Jackson then says like Dumbo's feather? And Damien tells him, I wouldn't know, I don't speak Disney. Meanwhile, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, Black Manta sits on his ship watching the news on the Teen Titans and he sees Jackson. He looks at the screen stating out loud, she thought I wouldn't find out that she could keep him a secret. This boy changes everything. Over at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, some of the city dwellers stop by the waters to see the seals when a little girl notices Jackson walking on water. He mutters to himself that he doesn't want to see his mother and now she's seen him on the news. Maybe he can actually get some of his questions answered. The little girl calls out to Jackson, shouting, Hi! Hi, hero! Jackson looks over at the girl and he waves, thinking that he'll finally find out who he really is. And as soon as Jackson walks into the restaurant, Lucia runs over hugging him and Jackson tells her he's fine, she doesn't need to be worried. She says that he doesn't know the first thing about Worry. She has a garbage truck of Worry that she can unload. The two take a seat and Jackson says, All right, tell me, am I Atlantean? Who's my father? Lucia says that he doesn't want anything to do with him. Nope, never, not gonna happen. She's not going to tell him who his father is. Jackson stops her telling her, you promised. But Lucia tells him, your father's a bad man. And that's not being dramatic. He would kill both of us if he knew about you. Lucia holds out a glass of water telling him that he's been so focused that his father is the reason that he can talk to water. But really, don't underestimate dear old mom. As the water pours out, the liquid begins to flow and change into a figure. As she finishes telling him, we have a lot more in common than you think. Jackson stares at the water asking, why? You made me feel like such a freak. Lucia continues telling him that it's the same reason they moved to the driest corner of the country and that necklace, no matter how well she hid it, it would always seem to find its way back. While Lucia talks, Starfire radios to Jackson telling him that there's a bank robbery in progress and they need his help. He gets up and he runs out of the restaurant and as she chases after him, he yells back that he has to go. Over at the Mission District, a pair of robbers flee from the bank when a giant green tail slams down on the front of their car. Gar begins to chew on the car asking, Do you get it? And while Starfire holds up a cell phone recording the action, she says that it's difficult to understand what he's saying with a car in his mouth. Gar spits out the car telling her, Puh! Sorry, I was asking, did you get that? But as Starfire and Beast Boy begin to clean up, a sewer lid shoots out of nowhere and Jackson jumps up shouting, I'm here! Gar points at the bad guy stating, as you can see, Squirt Gun, everything's under control. And Jackson shouts, you should have called me sooner! I'm no kid, Flash! He then takes one of the Hydro Swords and cuts into the lamppost and Starfire asks him what's wrong. He tells her that sometimes you wish so hard for something and when you get it, you realize that it's not what you wanted at all. Along the San Francisco Bay, Lucia looks at the Titans Tower sign telling Jackson that if he just knew how lucky they were to be alive right now. And that's when she hears a splash and a voice telling her, it's been a long time. There's so much to catch up on. She forms an axe of water, swinging back, shouting, Monster! And as Manta leaps out of the water, she yells, Stay away from my son! As the two of them fight, Manta tells Lucia that she betrayed him, and then he cuts into her shoulder, telling him, Tell me where the boy is. And then Jackson's voice calls out to Manta, telling him, Don't you touch her again! Don't you dare touch her again! Manta looks at Jackson and says, That's no way to speak to your father. And Jackson then suddenly stops. Lucia tells him that she's so sorry. She wanted to protect him from this, from him. Jackson lunges at Manta, and as he does, Manta takes the side of his harpoon and cracks it on the back of Jackson's head. Manta then takes the spear, holding it to Lucia's face, and Jackson shouts, Wait! If it's me you want, then I'll go! Just let her go! Inside of the tower, Damien speaks with his father, Batman, and as Batman tells him that he would like them to have weekly briefings about what's going on, Damien tells him, Actually, I wanted to talk about something else. Just like the Justice League delegates responsibilities and holds its members accountable. Batman tells him, we'll talk about it this weekend, but for now, I have to go. Before Damien can tell him to wait, Batman ends the call and then a cough can be heard. Damien spins around shouting to Raven, asking her, how long have you been there? And she tells him, actually, she's here to talk about Wally. Damien tells her, he's off the team. There's nothing to talk about. When he entered the time stream to rescue Deathstroke, he could have destroyed the multiverse, all for murder. If you're wondering about that storyline, I will link it down below, but it's the Lazarus contract. As Damien storms off, Raven tells him that he can justify his actions all he wants, but she knows that he regrets it, which is why he's so hard on Jackson. Damien turns to snap back, but then Lucia pulls herself in, bleeding on the floor, telling them that they need to help Jackson. Somewhere out in the Pacific on Manta's ship, Jackson tells him to take his helmet off and look at him. His whole life has been him blaming his mother for keeping him hidden, and now he gets it. She was afraid. But for him, he's not afraid, he's ashamed. 
Manto walks over with a knife telling him that his feelings are irrelevant. The only thing that matters is this, and that he snips off the seashell necklace. Jackson asks what he's even talking about, and Manta holds out the shell, telling him, This is no mere necklace, it's a map. The image of a location in the ocean then appears, and Manta explains that this was a map from the pirate captain, Madame Longrock. The surface world and Atlantis worked together to bring a war to her, and when she knew her time was coming, she hid the ring. The hidden location was in Zebel, the interdimensional aquatic prison that many know as the Bermuda Triangle. Getting into Zebel took everything he had, and once he got inside, he needed a guide. Jackson's mother. Over at Titan's Tower, Lucia is telling the same story to the others, explaining how she longed for a life outside of Zebel, and that's when she met him. Black Manta was a man on a mission, and he promised a life together once he was finished there. At the time, she knew his intentions were not for her, and she ended up trading out the shell map with a fake. Though he left not knowing that she had the real necklace, he also didn't know that he left her with an unborn child. Back with Jackson, he stands with Manta at their destination, asking, What is it with old maps saying things about uncharted territories? And he says, Beyond the reaches of any map I've ever known, here be the dragons. Manta then cuts Jackson's rope, telling him that he can try to escape, but he won't last long. The two of them then jump into the water, and Manta says, My father and I used to hunt for treasure. It was my lifelong dream to find the Black Pearl. However, while my father wanted it for fortune and glory, I always wanted it for different purposes. Jackson then asks what happened to his father, and after a moment of silence, Manta tells him, Don't bother trying to get close to me. I have nothing to give you. Jackson tells him, Fine. I'll talk. I play soccer. My favorite subject is math. My favorite band is a tribe called Quest. And I'm gay. The two continue to swim, and Manta says that he thought he was asking a question. Do you really think I care? You're all just meat. And while the two of them swim, a large eye opens up looking at him. Before the two of them is a glowing chest, and Jackson asks him, Is that it? Do we just swim in and swim out? Shouldn't this have just been harder? And just then, a giant octopus arm reaches out, grabbing Jackson and bringing him to its mouth. As Jackson is pulled away, the skull mouth containing the black pearl shuts, and Manta looks back. Before the giant sea creature can eat Jackson, he fires a beam into its arm, holding him, and he shouts, Fight with me, son! Manta then throws his spear into the creature's eye, and Jackson cuts himself free. Jackson says that he actually came back for him, and while Manta is grabbed, he shouts, Don't talk, just fight! Blind to the other eye! Jackson cuts the arm off that grabbed his father, and he asks, How exactly am I supposed to get close enough to do that? And Manta tells him, You're thinking too small. Understand your gift. The whole ocean is a weapon. Jackson begins to focus his strength, and as his eyes begin to light up with lightning, a giant electrical spear shoots out, piercing the creature's other eye. The creature starts to sink down below, and Jackson tells him, Can't believe it. This never happened before. Manta tells Jackson, you have much to learn about the depths of the ocean and the potential of your powers. I can teach you about power. He then points to the skull and he tells him, open it. And Jackson tells him, how? Isn't there some kind of cursed booby trap thing? Manta kicks Jackson across the face and he begins to beat on him, telling him, you would have died back there if it wasn't for me. Now do as I say. With that, Manta throws Jackson back into the mouth of the skull, slamming him into it. And the mouth slowly starts to open. Manta swims over, pushing Jackson away, telling him, only a child of Zebel can unlock the seal. Jackson then tells him, the only reason you saved me is so you can use me. Amanda asks if he really knows what it feels like to find something you've hunted for your entire life. He holds the ring up and Manta shouts, it's empowering. The two swim towards the surface and Jackson grabs his swords telling him, I thought I needed my father to know who I was, but I didn't. Jackson swings down and Manta drains the water from the swords and knocks him down onto the rocks. As Jackson struggles to get back up, he says, if there's one thing that I've learned, I can now see what I would have become if I was someone poisoned by hate. Manta tells him, you will learn to keep that mouth shut. And then a voice shouts, but I won't. Guard jumps out of the water as a shark, telling him, I'm kind of known for my big mouth. And he chomps down on Manta. The other Titans start to make their way down and Jackson says that they shouldn't have come. And Damien tells him, it's nice to see you too, squirt gun. Jackson goes on telling him, you all don't understand, he'll kill you all. And just then, Gar's body floats to the surface. Damien looks at the body and he says, there's no way that he could have drowned. He wasn't down there long enough. And Jackson pulls Gar out and begins to pull the water out of his lungs, telling them that Manta weighed him down on the water and now he has the black pearl. The whole ocean is his weapon. Just then, Manta leaps out of the water, washing everyone away, telling Jackson, you don't belong with your weakling friends or your coward mother. You belong to me! While Manta focuses back onto Jackson, Starfire blasts into the wave, shouting, Jackson is not yours to claim. Manta creates a wall of water, stopping Starfire's attacks, and then he forms a whirlpool, sucking her down, asking, Where could this girl possibly lead you but down? As Raven fights back, Jackson tells her, You need to teleport us away. And Raven says, No, turn that fear into rage and fight. Manta releases another barrage of attacks, telling Jackson that this is his last chance. Join me or die with them! 
Damien pulls himself up, holding onto his arm, telling Jackson, Since you joined the tower, you've been ready. Now it's time to prove it. Join the club of kids who have world-class psychos for fathers, and just keep fighting. It's what the Titans do. Jackson looks at his hands and he asks, how can he? Manta has the pearl and he's lost his swords. And Damien says, think back to what you said about Dumbo's magic feather. Manta might need the pearl, but you don't. As Damien's words ring through Jackson's head, he jumps forward at Manta. And just as Manta catches him, he electrifies the water all around them. The shock runs through Manta's body and then he falls into the water. Jackson quickly jumps in after him and he swims towards Manta holding out his hand. Manta reaches up and Jackson grabs his wrist. And then he pulls the ring off, telling Manta, I have family now and I never want to see you again. Later back at the Titan's Tower, Tempest stops by asking Jackson, what does he think about the title Aqualad? Jackson says, honestly, it feels like someone else's name. And it's kind of lame. Tempest tells him that he's been called it for years. Even if it sounds a little goofy, you've earned it. Jackson tells him, yeah, it's a lot goofy. And Tempest tells him it's a rough translation from Atlantean. It means son of the seven seas. I've come to love it. And I trust you will too, Jackson. As the two walk back towards the tower, Tempest goes on telling him that he's sorry that he couldn't have come sooner, but it looks like they really didn't need his help anyway. Jackson looks back at the Black Pearl and he asks what's going to happen to that, and Tempest tells him it's going to be hidden somewhere where there won't be a map. As the two turn the corner, Jackson sees the rest of the Titans standing there with a cake and a sign that says, Welcome to the Teen Titans, Aqualad. While everyone enjoys the party, Garb puts his videos up on YouTube, and a voice looking at the screen asks him, Really? You're a fool! And the second man looks closer at Gar and says, Yes, that's what makes him perfect. When we last left off with the Teen Titans, DC Metal had happened, and Damien realized that his team had been transformed into monsters and he was forced to fight them. Now as Damien stands around his fallen comrades, he holds out his sword, telling them, It wasn't supposed to end this way. I wanted to start over! And once Damien stabs himself, the room lights back up and he tells the computer to reset the program. Just before the computer can run the training program again, the rest of the Teen Titans walk in and Starfire asks if he knows what this looks like. Jackson Hyde tells him, yeah, after everything we've been through and getting turned into the dark versions of ourselves by the other you, the evil you that worked for the evil Batman, Damien turns back to the computer telling them that it's not what they think. I designed a virtual team so that we can still train even when we're not together. But the program keeps glitching and turning the avatars against me. Beast Boy laughs. <laughs> that sounds about right. Starfire then says that they came here so they can talk about Kid Flash. The rest of us have discussed it. We want Wally back. We know you think that he may have failed us, but that shouldn't be a reason to not give him a second chance. Damien stops her and says, He allied himself with one of the greatest villains, and he almost destroyed the universe. And Starfire tells him that they need to be able to fail. Then they learn from those failures. They need to feel accepted and respected and safe. And Damien asks, safe space? There's no such thing. Remember with him, this team wouldn't exist. I'm the one who makes all the hard decisions, including firing Kid Flash. If you think you can lead the team, then I will appoint Starfire as the leader. If you want Kid Flash so badly, go get him. A short while later, over at Star City, Damien flies out on Goliath in search of someone to replace Wally. Green Arrow talked about him having a half-sister as a potential recruit. So it's time to see what Amiko Queen is capable of. Down below, Emmy rides a jet ski closer to the transport ferry, and Green Arrow tells her, You gotta be careful. Onomatopoeia is way smarter than he looks. Do you need help? Emmy grabs her bow, telling him that this is his daily reminder that her code name is Red Arrow, and she does not need any help. Emmy then fires an arrow and pulls herself on board, landing just behind a large moving truck. Inside of that truck, Onomatopoeia starts yelling, Boom! 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 And suddenly his window is broken open. Emmy pulls Onomatopoeia out and throws him into a wall, firing three arrows into his jacket to hold him in place. She then says that she's not sure if Thack is a part of his vocabulary, but if he wants to hear it again, she's got plenty more arrows. Onomatopoeia just sits there, and he begins to say, Tick! 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 Realizing that he's referring to a bomb, Emmy jumps inside of the moving truck and hits the gas, driving it over the other parked cars and falling into the river below. But from the sudden stop of hitting the water, Emmy hits her head against the steering wheel and ends up knocking herself out. Goliath then flies down and starts to pull her out. And Emmy asks, who? And Damien tells her, just an admirer. Meanwhile, back at Central City, an armored truck blows its horn at a homeless man so that he would hurry up crossing the street. The homeless man looks back, pulling out a gun, and asks if he has any spare change. But before he can fire, there's a yellow and red flash blur. And Wally grabs the gun, telling him, If you need a fare for a ride to Iron Heights, I can get you there for free. 
But from the cart the man was pushing, another man jumps out telling Wally that he's pretty sure faster than a speeding bullet is the other guy, and he gets ready to pull the trigger. Just then there's a loud KOOM as an energy blast knocks both men away, and Beast Boy flies down as a pterodactyl, saying, Yo! I feel like I haven't seen you since the Triassic Age! Wally looks back to see everyone and asks what they're doing here. Raven flows down and tells him, It's what I've been telling you all along. You need the Teen Titans just as much as the Teen Titans need you. Back with Damien and Emmy, Emmy struggles to get free, shouting, Let me go! And Damien tells her, You know, you should show more gratitude. I was gonna offer you an opportunity of a lifetime. She grabs an arrow and stabs it into Goliath's arm, asking, Is this your weird, creepy way of hitting on me? Because I can hit back. Goliath roars as he lets go of Emmy, and she lands on a building. And Damien says that neither of them have powers. They are far more powerful than most many humans, though. She was raised by a ninja mother and a supervillain father where he was raised by a ninja mother and a supervillain grandfather. Emmy lets go of the arrow and Damien catches it, and he finishes by stating, we've also chosen to do good with our abilities. Goliath then sets Damien down and Emmy says that that's a nice trick, but how well can you do it with three arrows? Damien tosses the arrow that he caught, telling her that he knows virtually everything about her. Her IQ, blood type, the weight of her bow's pull. The numbers can only tell him so much, though. I'm here to see if you're worthy for a place on my Teen Titans. She pauses for a moment and then says, You've got to be kidding me. If you're not, then it's going to be a hard pass. She pets Goliath, telling him, The dog seems nice, but you seem like an absolute nightmare. Damien shouts, asking, Do you realize who you're insulting? I'm the one leading tomorrow's Justice League, and someday, we're going to be better. I mean, then asks, if that's the case, where's the team? All I see is you talking about this great team, but you're totally alone. I already fight with Green Arrow, Black Canary, and Arsenal. So why would I downgrade and play Junior Varsity? Meanwhile, over in Central City, Wally takes Raven's hand and says that he doesn't think it's a great idea. He's done some things that he regrets, and it's clear that he's got more of his father in him than he'd like to admit, but he's better on his own. Jackson High tells him that things are different now. Starfire is in charge, and things are a lot more chill. Raven then teleports herself and Wally to a building to talk alone. She says that there's an Azathenian saying, If you travel back in time, you become as dead as history. In other words, if you think too much about the past, you will lose your grip on the future. I can feel your regrets. They are pouring off of you. But know that you are in danger of becoming your father if you keep living your life in reverse. Wally thinks on it for a moment, and then he says that maybe he will consider coming back, but on one condition. Damien apologizes to his face. Back with Damien and Emmy. Green Arrow radios in that they've got some bad news. Onomatopoeia escaped before the Port Authority could get him. But before he left, he wrote a message out in blood, and it said, What does the sound of a tidal wave make? Emmy then jumps on the back of Goliath, stating that she needs to borrow his dog. She's screwed up, so hop on if he wants to help her fix it. As Goliath flies up, Emmy goes on, stating, Onomatopoeia didn't want to blow up the ferry. He wanted to drown the city. And at that moment, a truck underwater explodes, causing a massive tidal wave to head straight for Star City. But also at that time, Damien and Emmy's scanner picks up another alert. And someone broke into the Queen Industries weapons program and made out with some unimaginable things. As Goliath begins to head towards the water, Emmy says that she screwed up. She was too impulsive, so go ahead and revoke my invitation to your stupid little team. And Damien yells, you're insulting the greatest superhero team outside of the Justice League. And Emmy yells back asking, yeah? Then where are they? After flying back and forth, grabbing the civilians out of the boats, Emmy says that these so-called friends of yours, they're not going to make it, are they? Damien tells her to look up, and just as she does, Raven teleports in with the rest of the team, and Starfire shouts, Titans, together! Starfire, Jackson, and Beast Boy all dive into the water, and Starfire lifts up the boat and radios to Beast Boy, asking if he's familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale. Beast Boy yells, Roger that, time to get biblical, and then he turns into a giant whale, safely scooping up people in his mouth. Jackson and Raven then try to contain the tidal wave, by dispersing its force and shielding the city. But even with their combined strengths, Damien calls out to the people below to run. They won't be able to fully stop the wave. As the wave begins to get closer and it lands, there's a yellow and red blur. And Wally West stops by stating, running's my department. By the way, who's the girlfriend? Emmy yells back, I am not his girlfriend. And Raven then asks, why did you come? Wally starts running to create a barrier around the shore, stating that they helped him in Central City. How could he not return the favor? Everyone starts to get themselves into positions to hold back as much of the wave as they can, and Damien yells for everyone to brace for impact in three, two, one! And the wave then hits Damien, and it's just saliva from Goliath licking him. Damien shouts, stupid bat! And Emmy says that it looks like his friends don't hate him after all. Starfire and the others all head over to the pier, and Starfire says that she believes that this is what Beast Boy calls a punch butt. And Beast Boy tells her, actually, it's kick-ass. Green Arrow radios to Emmy, asking what happened down there, and she tells him that they've got it under control. Onomatopoeia set off a fusion bomb, and it tried to bring a tidal wave downtown. They managed to stop it. 
Green Arrow then says that they're still not finished yet. Anamanapia is a serial killer who targets non-powered superheroes, just like me and just like you. He must have wanted to draw you out in the open. He's planning to, but then from a nearby building, Anamanapia starts firing a minigun yelling, butta, 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 butta. Everyone jumps for cover, but as Emmy starts to fire off an arrow, she's hit in the shoulder by one of the passing bullets. She groans, falling to her knees, and seeing Emmy in pain, Damien pops the claws out of his gun, shouting, I'm gonna kill you! Wally sees Damien running up towards the building where Onomatopoeia is, and he says, oh no, Damien's girlfriend got shot, now he's going full on Tasmanian devil. As Onomatopoeia continues raining bullets down, Wally runs up grabbing each bullet that would have hit Damien, asking, how long would you have survived without me? Come on, little psycho, I'll team up and take this one down. Wally grabs Damien and he runs up the building, and as Onomatopoeia looks back, Wally says that the sound effect you're looking for is gulp. A short while later, once Onomatopoeia is arrested, Wally tells Damien, I'd be chopped liver if it wasn't for you, Kid Flash. I'm so glad you showed up, Kid Flash. Badass team up, Kid Flash. Damien turns his back, stating, If you're looking for an apology, don't bother. And after a few moments of silence, Wally pulls his mask down and says, The guys told me what happened in Gotham, with the city and how they all faced a dark version of you. Becoming my father is one thing that keeps me up at night, but being back with everyone, I know now that I don't have to do this alone. And neither do you. Wally then holds out a flash drive, stating, I've been keeping a close record on Deathstroke. All of the information is stored here, and if he ever comes back, we'll be ready. Damien takes the flash drive, and Wally starts to walk away, and Damien says, I fired you because you made a terrible decision that almost got everyone killed. You need to be better. We need to be better, all of us. Wally holds out his hand and says, Together? And Damien shakes on it, stating, Together. Just then, Emmy jumps down, stating that she's out of here. Green Arrow needs her. Damien asks, What about his invitation? She gives him a kiss on the cheek, stating, See you around. And as it turns out, your Teen Titans are pretty cool but I'm still way too cool to join. As she jumps off, Damien blushes. And as everyone begins to tease Damien, over in the Batcave, Alfred is watching the Teen Titan success, and he asks, are you ready to tell them that you're back, Master Tim? Tim looks at the monitor, telling him, soon, Alfred, soon. It was a quiet night at Wayne Manor as Bruce Wayne sits in his study reading a book. Not long ago, the Bat family had to fight off a future version of Tim Drake, one who had taken the Batman mantle and claimed the destruction of the world by a select few had come to pass. He had traveled back in time to prevent it from happening, and together the Bat family managed to hold the future Tim back until Hyper Time ultimately pulled him back to his own timeline. However, as Bruce reads his book, he begins to sense something, and he looks out his window to see a large bat-shaped figure coming his way. Before he even has a chance to react, future Tim breaks through the window, telling Bruce, Hello. Tim kicks Bruce back, and he asks, Didn't expect me back so soon, did ya? That hyper time just swallowed me up. Tim then kicks Bruce in the face and picks him up, throwing him into a wall. Bruce groans in pain as he gets up, wiping the blood from his nose, and he says, I'm gonna take a guess that there's another mission about the timeline needing to be saved. And the only way for your plan to succeed is for someone to die. You should know that I can't let that happen. Seconds later, Tim is thrown through the wall into the bathroom where Tim grabs a sink, bashing it over Bruce's head. The two go back and forth, hitting and kicking each other, grabbing onto anything that isn't bolted to the ground, giving them an upper hand. As the fight continues to make its way to the kitchen, Bruce flips Tim over the counter and Tim rolls off telling him, I'm not going anywhere until I get what I came for. Bruce tells him that he's gonna have to get through him if that's the case. And Tim says, I know, and he throws a knife into Bruce's his leg. Tim charges and tackling him to the ground, the two go back and forth, grabbing onto whatever they can get their hands on, hitting each other over and over again. As Tim falls down the stairs, Bruce takes out a knife, throwing it, cutting the wire to the chandelier. The weight of the chandelier causes it to fall fast down onto Tim, and as Tim pulls his arm back out, he's holding a gun. Bruce looks at the gun and says, even if you're from another timeline, shame on you for. But before Bruce could finish, there's a loud blam, and Bruce falls to the ground. Once Tim pulls himself out from under the chandelier, he takes Bruce's body, and he drags it to the Batcave, telling him, you have to learn a great deal skipping through time. Tim opens up a chest filled with several boxes, each with the symbols of the Justice League members. Tim says, one thing that I learned is that Batman's paranoia will be his biggest advantage. Next stop, Arctic. A short while later, Clark looks over his Fortress of Solitude, picking up pieces of the statues that Mr. Oz had recently destroyed. He tells Kellex that thankfully the pieces are large enough that they can be put back together. And Kellex tells him that he'll assist him in doing so. As Superman gets to work fusing the statues back together, Kellex gets a reading that they have an intruder. A homo sapien has breached their fortress. As Kellex goes to handle the intruder, Tim begins shooting at him. However, before Tim could do any damage, there's a red blur. And Superman grabs Tim, throwing him into the wall. 
Superman spits out a bullet that Tim fired, and Tim tells him, Ha! Those bullets were specifically made to put at least a little pause in your step. And Superman says that guns are a dead giveaway, that you're not my Batman. That and your suit specs are different. Tim gets back up telling him that there have been some modifications. Physiology dampener and vocal disruptor. But before he could finish, Superman smacks the vocal disruptor off, telling him, You're Tim Drake, but older. Another timeline? Tim tells him, I could tell you where I'm from and when, but then I would have to kill you. All I came here to do is to make sure that you won't prevent me from completing my appointed mission. Superman asks, who appointed you? And Tim fires two missiles, stating, that's none of your business! Superman easily blasts the missiles with his heat vision, and as the smoke clears, he sees Tim operating one of the Kryptonian battle armor suits. Superman asks, how could you control it? And Tim punches Superman, telling him, Superman from my world taught me how to read and speak Kryptonian. Tim then starts to step down onto Superman, and he grabs him, throwing him outside, stating, Connor worshipped the ground that you walked on. If only he could see you now. Tim begins to climb out of the hole that he threw Superman out of, and Superman's eyes begin to glow red and he flies over, ripping apart the battle suit, throwing Tim to the ground. Superman begins to walk over asking, What are you here for now? I read Batman's reports on your last little visit. Tim pushes a button on his glove, telling him, Something much bigger than you. Before Superman realizes it, though, a red cage starts to wrap itself around him and contain him. Superman tries to beat against the glass, but Tim tells him, It's no use. That cage is lined with red kryptonite. Superman yells, this isn't over! Batman will, and Tim stops him, telling him, no, he won't, and neither will Superman. I'm sorry to say this, because there's no more time. To save our world, I have to kill Superboy. Later that night in Metropolis, Tim looks over his point of entry in the apartment building of Jonathan Kent. He fires an anchor into the wall, but before he can launch a hook into it, his arm begins to become distorted. He shouts as he tries to regain control of his body, stating that hypertime is trying to pull him back again, but he can't leave yet! He's gotta keep it together. He focuses, flexing his arm until the distortion goes away and quickly fires the hook into the connecting anchor. Once he crosses the gap, he opens the window to Jonathan's room, jumping and firing two trank darts into the bed. Tim then grabs the blanket so that he can secure Jonathan, but as he pulls back, he sees that Jonathan is already gone. Lois hears the noise opening the door, asking if everything's all right, but that's when she sees Batman standing there. Tim shoots another trank dart into her neck, telling her, shush. Meanwhile, over in New York City, Damien and his team Titans battle against the villains known as the Hangman. Damien calls out that they don't have to hold back on these assassins, and just as he says that, each Titan begins to get taken down. Just before the villains can finish the Teen Titans off, there's a red-blue blur that shoots by, bouncing into each of the five Hangmen. Only a minute later, Gar tells Wally that that was a good job he did taking out Breathtaker. Gar says that he wasn't the one on Provoke, he was busy with Shocky. Little Jiu-Jitsu mixed in with his secret tactics. Starfire says, wait, if Kid Flash and Beast Boy didn't stop them, then who did? Damien pulls out a small flare and he fires it into the air, telling Starfire to do him a favor. The flare goes off in the sky and someone begins to cough, and Damien finishes, stating, Catch Superboy! A second later, Jonathan comes crashing down onto Starfire, and as she catches him, she tells him not to worry, she has him. Later at Titan's Tower in San Francisco, Damien tells Jonathan that they've been over this before. He's not a Teen Titan! That is, unless a majority vote is passed. Jonathan says that after the Cracklow stuff, he promised he'd take him on a mission once a month. That was three months ago, Damien! Starfire asks him if that's true, and Damien says that, I never officially said that. I only said that I would keep you focused. And Jonathan yells, so you lied! You never had any intention of bringing me! But just then a voice comes in over the intercoms, telling them that he has full control over Titan Tower. There's no escape from this room. Gar looks back and sees Tim on the screen asking, is that Batman? And Damien tells him, it is most definitely not. That's Tim Drake, only older, from a different timeline. Raven asks, why didn't you mention this as the leader of the Teen Titans? And Damien tells her, because it was a bad family problem. Tim gained control of the system since they were his original design. That being said, he's here for one thing, and that's to prevent a future that he knows is gonna come. Tim tells Raven, go ahead, project my memory so that they can all see that I'm telling the truth. That way they know it to be genuine. Images begin to appear, and what they see is an older version of Tim, Damien, and Jonathan. Lines were crossed, actions were taken. Jonathan flew into the sky, unleashing an uncontrollable blast. There was destruction, suffering, and millions dead. Jackson Hyde asks, what did we just see? And Raven explains that it was a vision of Atropolis, destroyed millions died all because of Superboy. From another room in the tower, Tim shouts, this is the definitive future, and that's the one I'm here to fight and stop. Suddenly a black liquid shoots out, hitting John, and as Wally runs to the door, he's electrocuted, knocked away. Starfire quickly begins to blast the liquid off, but the more that John fights against it, the more it begins to cover him. As panic begins to set in, John shouts, asking for someone to help him, and his eyes begin to flare, and Tim says, no, it's too soon, and John shoots an uncontrolled Controllable heat blast from his eyes. Damien shouts, We have to get out of here! Fly with everything you've got or it's gonna kill us! Jonathan rockets through the building. 
telling Damien, tell my mom and dad I'm sorry. And John climbs higher into the sky with his powers beginning to erupt, releasing a powerful explosion. Raven quickly creates a barrier, telling Wally to strengthen it with the speed force. But as the energy begins to come back, it blows up the entire tower roof. Meanwhile, in a different time and place, three people watch on a monitor. And as it pings, the woman says, Tim's cloaking device has been disrupted by something massive. And one of the men asks, Cassie, is he dead? And she responds, stating, she can't get a read on his vitals. And the man then says, what should we do, Connor? And Connor says, what Titans do, Bart. We find him and we bring him home together. As Titan Tower begins to burn to the ground, the blast knocked all of the Titans out except for Damien and Tim. Tim gets up looking around, telling him, my cloaking device has been damaged in the blast, but this is the prototype Titan uniforms. Maybe I can use them to forge a new identity and become untraceable again. Damien, though, begins to back up, checking the computer to see the vital signs of the other members. The computer tells him that there are life signs for all of the Teen Titan members. Though unconscious, they are strong and accounted for. Damien then asks to give him the location of Superboy now. And moments later, Damien takes his submarine and goes into the water to pull Jonathan out. All the while, Tim is working on his new costume, stitching together many of the prototype suits. He says, from the rising sun came a bat out of hell, but I am now savior. Back with Damien, he begins to head out and he asks Jonathan if he's all right. Jonathan sulks, telling him, no, what if I had hurt someone? And Damien says, just relax, I checked the vitals, everyone's fine. Unconscious, but you didn't kill anyone. What happened to you wasn't your fault, you were pushed to the edge. But the Titans aren't the problem right now, it's Tim Drake. He had every intention of killing Batwoman if he hadn't been pulled out of our timeline. He'll do the same thing to you. Damien then starts working on the computer and Jonathan asks, who are you trying to reach with the comm link? And Damien tells him, our fathers, even though I said I would never call them, they should know that Drake is back. But I can't reach them either. Jonathan begins to look around himself asking, what was that anyway? That power, where did it come from? And Damien says, I'll look into Batman's files. I know the Superman has a solar flare. A solar flare is something that Superman can control and use for good, but you, given the mixed DNA, you might not be able to control it like your father. Jonathan then says that he won't be responsible for killing innocent people in this time or any other. And Damien tells him, I won't let that happen. I'm gonna keep you safe, John. John tells him, thanks. And Damien asks, friends are supposed to help each other. Right? And Jonathan says, I thought we were just partners. And Damien tells him, shut up. Later at Titan's Tower, Wally runs through the entire building looking for Damien and John, but he only finds a note stating, give me time, signed R. Raven tells him that she could have told him they weren't there. That and Tim Drake is also standing directly behind them. As everyone looks back, they see Tim as savior, with his guns pointed right at them, telling him, I'm willing to talk. Raven tells him if he says so, he could holster his weapons. Even though they're from different timelines, they still share an emotional connection. Tim tells everyone, we don't have much time. There isn't much left of my suit after Superboy went all Kira on us. So from here on out, call me savior. But as you can see, I'm not the bad guy here. The scariest thing that you all witnessed was just a small representation of what Jonathan Kent is capable of when pushed. And Jackson tells him, yeah, from the looks of it, it was you doing the pushing. Tim says, that's right, and he barely knows me. Imagine what would happen if someone close pushed him. I've seen it. Thanks to Raven, so have you. Even Robin did, and he chooses to keep Superboy away from us. And Starfire corrects him, stating, no, from you. Tim tells her, no, I mean them. If we don't do something, there's going to be a future generation unborn due to what Superboy does. Wally then asks, what does he mean by do something? And Tim calmly tells everyone, we have to terminate him. Starfire tells him to say the word. She wants him to say it out loud so that everyone knows what he's implying. And Tim says, we have to kill Superboy. And if Damien gets in the way, we have to kill him too. Jonathan asks, what if we get in your way? And Tim tells him, I'll do what I must. The Starfire then says, we will too. Gar separates the two of them, stating, let's dial it down the drama here for a second. First, no one's going to kill anyone. However, I am inclined to believe Tim's motivation given Superboy's little fireworks show. Raven then says they'll depower him so that they can contain and help him. Those are the options for someone who hasn't unleashed his powers to commit a crime. If Tim can agree to these terms, they'll help him. After a few moments of silence, Tim says, I agree. But if we're going to do something, we have to leave now. And Starfire tells him, Robin said to give him time, so we're going to give him time. However, at that exact moment, the hyper time begins to pull away at Tim's arm, and as his hand disappears, it starts to appear somewhere else. Over in Titans of Tomorrow headquarters, a blue light shines over the room, and Cassie shouts that the time phase is activating. Just then, Tim's hand begins to appear, and Bart quickly grabs a hold of it, trying to pull Tim back. However, as Bart pulls, he tells everyone that it's pulling them in, and in the current time, Tim shouts in pain, telling everyone that the people from his time are coming for him. Starfire wants to give Damien time, but we don't have it. We have 
have to do something now, Raven. Gar yells that they need to help Tim. They have seen his cards. Once they get Superboy, they'll sort this all out. Starfire sees Raven focusing her power and fires a blast, telling her not to do it. But as Raven opens up her eyes, she says she has to. In a flash of light, Raven disappears with both Gar and Tim, and Wally says that they did it. They're gone. And Jackson tells them not to worry. Superboy gives off a distinct energy signature. And they're surrounded by water. And when he looks into the water, he can find exactly where Damien and Jonathan are. After searching in the water, Jackson follows the trail left by Jonathan's energy and finds an underwater structure. Jackson radios back that he's at the location where Damien took Jonathan. So when they're ready, hit it. Up above, Starfire and Wally hover in the Titan's jet, telling them that they're coming in hard and fast. Meanwhile, over in Damien's makeshift hideout, the computer warns that there's an incoming attack. He yells at the computer to arm itself with non-lethal weapons. Take out whoever's out there! And seconds later, Starfire aims the jet down, flying it into the water, crashing into Damien's hideout. Once the jet is lodged in without leaking water, Starfire and Wally jump out and they begin to make their way through the facility. Just as the Titans start to move in, both Jonathan and Damien spring out of the vents ready to attack, with Starfire telling Damien to wait, but Damien fires his grappling hook and wraps it around Jackson Hyde. Jonathan then shoots by, grabbing Wally's legs out from underneath him and says, I'm really sorry I have to do this, and then Starfire fires a blast into Jonathan, allowing Wally to free himself to take on Damien. Damien shouts to Jonathan not to hold back his punches. We need to stop them from taking you. And then Wally runs circles around Damien, and just as he stops, he grabs Damien from behind, telling him that he made a mistake letting him get close. And Damien says, no, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. This gas is something special that I've been working on in case we have to fight evil speedsters. I call it slow-mo. Jackson continues to struggle with the grappling hook, but as he flexes his muscles, he breaks free, shouting, I've had enough of this. He creates two water spouts that shoot out of the ground, crashing into Damien and Jonathan, ultimately stopping them from attacking. As the two boys sit down, Starfire asks, now can we please talk? And Damien tells her, we're not handing Jonathan over. Wally tells him, yeah, neither are we and Jackson that adds that Raven and Beast Boy chose a side just didn't happen to be theirs after a few minutes of explaining their plan Damien shouts asking is it the best you could think of knocking them out and Starfire tells him yes it's the only way that Raven could not track you guys wouldn't you agree Superboy Damien continues to yell but Superboy punches and knocks him out and says actually I don't agree but before you knock me out here's the coordinates of the fortress it's the safest place that I can think of Jonathan then holds up his fist and says I'm not exactly excited about this just make sure to add some speed to this, Kid Flash. Wally grabs Jonathan's fist and tells him, sure, no problem, and then crack! A short while later at the Fortress of Solitude, Jackson and Wally move Damien and Jonathan inside, and after grabbing a piece of ice, Jackson changes it to water to wake them up. Damien wakes up shouting, what the heck? No smelling salts, Andy? And as the two of them get up, everyone looks around at the destruction. The Starfire says that she hates to say it, but it doesn't appear that this is the bastion of safety that he had hoped for. Damien says that he knew they should have come here, but while Jonathan flies around, he notices something outside. He rushes out there to find his father, Superman, still trapped in the cage that Tim had set up for him. He touches it, asking what happened, and Superman tells him to get back. His powers will be weakened if he gets any closer. Jonathan hits it with his heat vision, trying to free his father, but as everyone gets closer, Superman tells them to get Jonathan away. He then tells Jackson to push this chamber under the ice. It's the only way. As everyone begins to pull Jonathan away from his father, he screams, let me go! What's up a safe distance away? And once he's a safe distance away, Superman tells Jackson to do it. Jackson places both of his hands on the ground and the ice begins to splinter. As Superman tells him, you have to be brave. As Jonathan watches the cave fall beneath the surface, he screams, releasing a wave of energy. Below the surface, the pressure pushed against the cage is enough to break it, allowing Superman to free himself. He flies back out from under the ground and he yells to Jonathan, but through Jonathan's anger, he can't hear him. He thinks he thinks his father is gone. He thinks that Tim did this, and he thinks he's about to kill millions. Superman tells everyone that Jonathan is in some sort of trance. He's creating some kind of emotional superstorm. Just then, Raven appears with Gar and Tim once she's got a lock on Jonathan's emotional level. But before they can even fully appear, Superman charges at Tim, asking him, what have you done? Superman squeezes on his head, and Tim tells him, same solar flare power that you do. But because he's half human, he can't control it. You have to let this happen. If Superboy dies here today, millions can be saved. But just just then, there's another flash of light, and inside it is Connor, Cassie, and Bart, the Titans of tomorrow. Wally asks who's that, and Cassie tells them that they're here to bring back their teammate. While Bart tries to control Tim's hand, he says that this thing's got a mind of its own, and it led us to some kids that are about to go boom! As Jonathan's solar flare starts to gain power, Cassie uses her lasso to try to keep it from expanding, and tells everyone that they shouldn't be standing around. Titans together! Gar turns into a giant octopus, and he positions himself on the top of the orb, while Cassie tells Raven to try and contain the blast. Super Superman calls out to the flashes to start running counterclockwise so that they can try and reverse the polarity. But while everyone
everyone works together to try and stop Jonathan from going out of control. Superman looks at Tim, telling him, I don't have time to deal with you. I'm going inside of the flare and I'm gonna get him out. But before he goes, Connor stops him, telling him, wait, who's inside of there? And Superman tells him, my 10-year-old son, Jonathan, I have to save him. Both Superman and Connor look at the ever-expanding orb and Connor says that they are going to save him. He failed them once, he's not going to let this happen again. They both race to the center of the flare and Tim feels himself being pulled back again by hyper time. And he says that they are willing to sacrifice themselves to save him. Damien then jumps in the back of Tim's head shouting, this is all your fault, you screwed up the timeline and they're all gonna be killed because of you. Tim throws Damien off telling him that he knows what to do now. He'll save them all and take the power with them. Just then as Tim's body is sucked into hyper time, he begins to absorb the blast telling everyone to stop. He'll handle this. As the portal to hyper time opens, Tim is pulled inside along with the solar flare. And as the blast begins to fade, Superman picks Jonathan up and Jonathan asks what happened. Superman tells him that he has made things right by giving all he had to save him. As the portal begins to close, everyone sees Tim inside and many events happening throughout time. But then in one last flash, that portal disappears. Everyone begins to get back up and Gar asks, what did they just see? And Raven tells him that they saw a version of Tim sacrificing himself for them. Wally then asks all of those images, were they the past, present, or future? As Superman says, that that's another question that needs answers. In all of this action, we've never been properly introduced. Who are you all and why are you wearing my S? Connor tells him that he doesn't know him yet, but once he told him that when it comes to time travel and alternate realities, the less they say and do, the better. Superman tells him, that sounds like good advice. We're very sorry for the loss of, but Cassie stops him telling him, Tim Drake isn't dead. He's now everywhere and everywhen. Damien then says that he has so many questions. This way they can learn about, but Cassie stops him telling him, that's exactly why we can't stay. Whatever is coming your way, you need to figure it out on your own. Jackson then asks, how are they gonna get back? And Bart says that the residual reverse. Wally says that they can use the same speed force that they came in on, like a time tether and slingshot back, right? And Bart laughs, telling him, ha <laughs> not bad. Both Superman and Connor shake hands, and Bart starts to race around until he creates a portal for them to return home in. Once the three disappear, Gar says that he thinks he knows the blonde, wish they had gotten names. And Wally smiles, telling him, I got something better than names, and he pulls out his phone, showing that he got a selfie. Pretty cool, right? Right before they phased out, little souvenir. Raven grabs the phone, blowing it up, asking, do you want to compromise the timeline and more lives? And Wally laughs, stating, you know, I can just re-download that from the cloud. And Raven snaps. This is not a time to be joking. A version of Tim Drake, someone that all of us are close to, just sacrificed himself in front of all of us less than a minute ago. And you want to smile and take selfies? Wally sighs, telling her, I'm sorry. I really wasn't thinking. I just got caught up seeing another flash. Superman then directs Jonathan and Damien away, stating that it seems that they've got some things to clear up. Excuse us. And a short while later, back at Wayne Manor, Bruce begins to open up his eyes and he sees Alfred waiting with breakfast. He asks, how long have I been unconscious? Alfred pours him a glass of orange juice, telling him that he must have had a dream. Bruce says, dream, huh? Back at the Fortress of Solitude, Jonathan and Damien look at Clark, who's standing there for five minutes without saying a word. Damien whispers, what is he thinking about? This is all done. Can we go home now? As Superman tells him that he's not so sure that he agrees with everything being wrapped up. Jonathan points to his ear, stating, super hearing, remember? And Damien scoffs, stupid powers. Clark then says that he may have to reassess this partnership of theirs. Damien seems to be a catalyst for some far-flung future maelstrom that ends up engulfing my son. So Damien should understand my concern about you guys going out and doing your crime fighting. Damien says that they're talking about a possible future, not one set in stone. A Superman tells him, yes, but if he can do something to make sure that it doesn't happen as a father, he will stop. But Damien stops him and says, look, Jonathan's possible future is already altered the minute that Tim absorbed the solar flare. So I can swear that I will never put Jonathan in harm's way. And Jonathan says, that's right. Just like I'm going to protect Damien and whatever the world has in store for his possible future. So there's nothing to worry about, Pop. Staying close to Damien, being a friend in good times and bad is the answer. Not pushing him away. We're only going to learn by making our own choices. Superman smiles, asking, when did you get so smart? And Jonathan tells him, maybe it's because I listen to what you and mom have to say all the time. As Damien and Jonathan head back outside, he asks Starfire what's going on, and she says they need to have a meeting and talk about what just happened. Savior fractured them easily. It's important to speak about their feelings. And Gar says that it'll be hard since the tower's kind of blown up. And Jonathan tells him that he's really sorry about that. Superman says, don't worry. You can have a temporary headquarters until you get things back up. Initiate Justice League headquarters transport code for eight on my mark. Seconds later, everyone is teleported away and Superman welcomes everyone to the Justice League headquarters. Their meeting table is theirs to use and he'll be in the monitor room if they need him. All of the Titans walk over to the meeting table and as Jonathan walks away, Damian slams his fist down stating, meetings call to order. I move that we put Superboy up for vote to be a half 
half member of the Teen Titans, later to be recognized as a full member when he turns 13 years of age. Before everyone can vote though, Jonathan runs back stating, I'm sorry, I overheard, but is there anything I can do to convince you? And Damien gives him a thumbs up and says, that won't be necessary. Jonathan smiles stating, okay, I'll let you get on with it then. Just then, Bruce walks up telling Damien that he would like a full report on everything that just happened. And what are you voting on? Damien says, whether or not Superboy can join the Teen Titans. Bruce tells him, everyone go ahead and give me a show of hands. Damien puts his hand up, but no one else does. And Bruce says, the nays have it. Sorry, Superboy. Starfire tells Jonathan that it's not about him. It's about how much they have to figure out about themselves. And Jackson adds that they really need to work on them as a team more than anything else. With Jonathan sighing, stating, right? I'll see you later then. As Jonathan walks away, Damien runs over stating that he's sorry about that. And Jonathan tells him, it's okay. Thanks for having my back though. And Damien says, hey, what are partners for? And Jonathan asks, friends, right? And Damien asks, friends? You just had to ruin it, didn't you? And Jonathan says, sorry. But Damien pats Jonathan on the shoulder, telling him, don't be. After the fight against the future Tim Drake, the Teen Titans found themselves picking up the pieces of a broken Titans tower. But among the destroyed wreckage, Gar, Beast Boy, finds himself the one thing connecting him back to his family, an old half-burned photo. He looks at the photo and he thinks to himself that there was once a time when he was going by the name Changeling. But if there's one thing that holds true to that name, it's that nothing ever lasts in life. Starfire begins to move some of the debris out of the way, stating that it's going to take some time and heart, but they can come back from this. Gar tells her that he knows that she's a sun worshiper and all, but there's really no bright sign to them losing their home. Even if they rebuild, why even bother? Starfire points over to one of her Zorka plants that survived the attack and says that something like a plant can still remain alive, then there is life, and with life, there is hope. Wally tells her, yeah, things have fallen apart before. Like how Damien fired me, and then I came back? We always come back. Gar looks at the picture again and he tells everyone that he's sorry, but right now he's feeling like flying solo for a bit. Then he changes into a hawk and flies off. Meanwhile, over at the Golden Gate Bridge, a school bus full of people make their way to the school when one of the kids inside starts getting picked on. The young kid sits alone tinkering with his own devices when the school bully starts hitting him with spitballs across his glasses. As everyone starts to laugh at the kid, he pulls down his glasses and reveals lines of computer code running over his eyes. The kids get up and they walk to the front of the bus, and within a few seconds, the bus driver is thrown out the door and he swerves the bus over the edge. That bus begins to hit the barrier and it drives off, with the kid hitting his head on the steering wheel, and then he's thrown out of the bus. Back with the Teen Titans, an alarm goes off at Damien's computer and he tells everyone that they got trouble. They gotta move out. Jackson jumps into the water and he starts to create a hard water construct ramp, giving Wally a straight shot at the bus to help slow it down. Raven teleports inside of the bus, trying to steer it down the ramp that Jackson and Wally are creating. And Wally tells her, don't worry, she's got this. Raven grips the steering wheel, telling him that she's not so sure she doesn't even have a driver's license yet. And while the bus makes its way down to land, Starfire shoots by grabbing the child that had been thrown out, making sure that he's safe. Land. But while the Teen Titans save the children, Gar heads over to Hibernaclium Park to throw the first pitch of the Sacramento River Bats game. The coach tells Gar to make sure not to choke out there with all 50 people watching him. Gar tosses him his phone telling him, just keep the camera steady. Need to make sure all of my fans get a good view of this. He steps out and the game announcer asks everyone to please welcome Yeast Boy! Gar sighs telling them it's Beast Boy. And the catcher calls to him that no one really cares, loser. Just throw the ball already. Gar changes into a bull, telling him that he was gonna go easy, but he's got a better costume in his trunk. He then changes into an elephant and launches the ball, knocking the catcher into the wall, and then everyone begins to boo him. While the catcher's having his hand looked at, Gar begins to walk back to the locker room, telling him clearly he's not too much of a team player these days. As he sits down and looks at his picture, Gar hears a girl calling out to him when he quickly tells them to just leave him alone. The girl asks if he can't spare a minute for a fan, and Gar turns back telling her, Fan? What? <laughs> Diggity dog! As Gar turns into a puppy, he jumps at the green-haired girl and then phases through her. And before he can ask, she tells him that she should explain. First, her name is Joran. Second, he isn't the only one who likes to play make-believe, so she has a proposal for him, one that she hopes would be mutually beneficial. A short while later, on a pirate ship in the middle of the Moara Woods, outside of San Francisco, Gar looks around asking what is this place. Joran tells him, welcome to Neverland. Other than living here, she works here with her lost boys. Joran leads Gar down the stairs, and Gar sees a room full of techies. Joran then goes on to explain that Wade here is living on a beach selling motorized surfboards that he designed. Kimmy over there was kicked out of school for developing an anti-bully repellent made out of skunk glands. Gar high-fives everyone, asking, What are you all, like a weirdo version of Silicon Valley? Joran laughs, telling him that they're just square pegs trying to live in a round hole world. They're misfits and outsiders just like him. She herself started out making remote-controlled puppets. Gar looks around and asks, where does he come in? 
And Joran says, well, she's been working on something special and she holds out a small tube with an implant floating inside of it. Joran goes on stating that this is a device that she labeled Pixie, named after Tinkerbell's magic dust. It's the next step in Bioware technology. It's a VR implant that allows the user to live in many worlds at once. Joran then reaches out touching Gar's hand and as she does, she starts to change form into her original punky blonde self, stating that the Teen Titans don't support or understand him. Like him, her parents died when she was young. So what does he say? Wanna be weirdos together? Meanwhile, over at the UCSF Medical Center, the Teen Titans wait in the hospital nearby to hear the results on the kids. When Starfire asks, what about him? The doctor says he'll be fine. However, they had to remove a small implant from the boy's dural matter between his frontal lobe and nasal cavity. The same implant that Joran just gave Beast Boy. Damien takes the tube stating that it appears that he was outfitted with some sort of bleeding edge brain implant. Starfire says, wouldn't that be cutting edge? Damien tells her no. The difference between cutting edge and bleeding edge is that the bleeding edge will kill you. Back at Neverland, Joran asks, well, she wants them to build something together. Gar looks at the implant thinking, change might be a good thing. His powers are awesome and all, but they can't help what he's struggling with on the inside. He then says, let's do it. Second star to the right and straight on till morning, right? She loads up the injector and hands it to Gar, telling him not to worry, it's perfectly safe. He places the injector over his nose and then he pulls the trigger. As Gar falls over, Joran asks if he's all right and he snaps back up with his eyes changing from green to purple, telling her that he feels good. Who needs the Teen Titans when he has her? Soon a world of possibilities begin to flash before Gar's eyes and Joran begins yelling at Gar to snap out of it. When he blinks, he comes back to reality and she says that sometimes it's hard to return, isn't it? Gar takes out his phone, telling her that it was incredible. If only there was a way to share that experience with his fans, and Joran says that he can. Soon they'll be releasing Pixie to a limited market, and she wants him to be there at the launch. Invitations will be sent out to a very select few, and with them, they're going to make their dreams come true. Meanwhile, back at Titan's Tower, Wally tells Raven to try it now, and activates the controls, and the T-Jet fires up. Raven turns the jet off, stating that if only people could be fixed so easily, maybe things would be different between them. And Wally laughs, telling her, yeah, if only. She holds Wally's hand and a symbol appears, and then Wally asks what was that, and she tells him it's the Azarathian symbol for hope and patience. Be patient with her and maybe. Before the two could go on, Damien walks through breaking the two up, asking if it's ready yet, and Wally says, other than a car wash, the T-Jet is operational. Damien scoffs, telling him that it's not ideal, but he needs to use the portable lab since the tower's facilities were destroyed. The device that was in the skull of that boy appears to be coming from a startup company called Neverland. The boy was a straight A student with no behavioral problems in the past. One would go as far as to call him a model student. He was bullied terribly, so it's possible that he may have just snapped and that device was a synaptic connection to his frontal lobe. So it could be possible that he was being puppeted. No one has heard much about the company and the only thing on the web is just rumors. After some digging, he was able to find out about an exclusive invitation from Neverland. It's time for the Teen Titans to go undercover. Later that night at the Neverland launch event, Gar looks out at the theater and says they've really packed this place, huh? Joran tells him it's because those people are sick of feeling alone, but there is something else. She's really hoping that he doesn't get mad that she went through his things. Joran pulls out the photo that Gar kept of his family, but rather than seeing it all burned and destroyed, he sees it fully restored. She says that she could see how much this meant to him, so she restored it using some image processing. Gar takes the photo telling her, whoa, and Joran leans in asking, do you miss them? He stares at the photo stating, honestly, I don't remember them that well. It's more about what they represent, a better life than the one I have now, which is why I'm always changing my teams and appearance. Joran sighs, stating that she can relate to dissatisfaction. But as for her parents, she doesn't miss them at all. When her father was drunk, he would go after her with whatever he could in arm's reach, his fist, belt, lit cigarette, anything. The only way that she was able to survive was to escape and her puppets were the way out. She loved them because it made her feel like she was in control. Just then, one of the other boys knocks on the door stating that everything is ready and Joran changes back into her green-haired form, telling him, all right. Gar tells her to hang on a sec. She can't go out there pretending to be someone that she's not. They need to love her for who she is. Take her from the guy whose DNA is type zoo. Joran pauses for a moment and then changes back, kissing Gar, telling him, okay then, let's go be weird and vulnerable together. Gar gallops out in the form of a stallion as Joran rides him, and the crowd cheers and claps. Joran hops off quietly, stating, see what they do, and then it turns to everyone telling them thank you for coming and supporting their company. As they know, they are not one of the cool rich kids from Silicon Valley. They are the punky upstart. To demonstrate, she tied Beast Boy's implant into her holographic projector. This way, they'll be able to get a sense of what is possible with Pixie. Gar's eyes begin to light up, and the stage changes to a scene where Gar is fighting a fire-breathing dragon. Seconds later, it changes to Gar having a shootout with a bad guy, and then him battling aliens as a Green Lantern. Joran tells everyone whether they want to raid a dragon's horde, bring justice to the frontier, 
volunteer or know what it's like to be a hero, they can do so with Pixie. Everyone here tonight will receive a free Pixie and with it a syringe gun that will allow them to safely put the implant into themselves. All they have to do is put the nozzle into their nostril and pull the trigger. When Joran continues her speech though, a battering then shoots out from the back, grabbing Gar by the leg and pulling him back off stage. Damien says first he ditches the team, and now the next day you hook up with the enemy? Explain yourself! Gar changes into a crab, cutting the wires, asking, What are you talking about? Joran's my friend, and unlike you, she understands and respects me instead of treating me like a joke. Damien asks, Would you rather be a joke or a pawn? That implant is a backdoor to mind control, even if this company has good intentions, which I'm guessing they don't. They are still biohacking their users. Joran pulls back the curtain, asking if everything's okay back there, and both Damien and Gar shout, No! Gar begins to walk away, telling Damien that he's just jealous of people like him. He has to bully people because he has no friends. Starfire flies in, stating that that is not true. They are Damien's friends. And Jackson also says that they are Beast Boy's friends, too. Joran pulls Gar away, stating that it's time for them all to leave. And Damien asks, where do you think you're going, freak? Just then, Gar's body begins to grow, and he changes into a giant gargoyle, letting out a bellowing growl. Gar starts wildly swinging at everyone, and Wally tells him not to do it. But Damien says it's no use. He's under her spell. Joran tells Damien... He's not alone. Everyone here is now my puppets. Seconds later, Gar bursts out of the theater with Joran on his back, but before he can get too far, Damien throws another battering, grabbing his leg. He is then pulled out of the theater as he shouts, Give him back, Joran! Gar swipes at his leg, cutting the wire, but before anyone can come to save him, the other Teen Titans have to deal with Joran's mind-controlled mob. As Damien falls, he lets out a loud whistle, and a moment later, Goliath swoops in, biting down and grabbing Damien by his cape. Damien asks, what took you so long? And Goliath grunts. And Damien says, stupid bat. Goliath grunts again and Damien says, yes, let's go kick some ass. As Goliath flies over towards Gar, Damien shouts asking Jordan, what are you doing? And Jordan yells back, it's because of people like you. I've seen Gar's vlogs. You're nothing but a bully. Gar's a victim, just like Kid Flash, Raven, and Starfire. Damien tells her, I don't need your judgment. I've made mistakes, but we've moved past them. Joran shouts, the very existence of the Teen Titans is an ongoing hostage scenario. Gar's only stuck with you because he has Stockholm Syndrome. But that doesn't matter, Gar's done with the Teen Titans. He's now one of the lost boys. Gar swings his claws, tearing through a part of Goliath's wing. And just as Goliath starts to fly down, Damien throws a fistful of powder into Gar's face. Damien then calls out that he doesn't need to listen to her. He is still one of them, whether he likes it or not. Back down on the street, the mob starts to surround everyone, and Starfire asks Wally, can't he jiggle those devices out of their heads like he jiggles through walls? Wally says, uh, what? Are you talking about vibrating? Walls is one thing, a brain's another. I'm still kind of a junior varsity when it comes to the speed force thing. Raven asks, what happens if we leave them like this? The last few months, they talked a lot about fear and doubt. Remember that Azarethian symbol? Wally asks, the one for hope and patience? And Raven tells him that he needs to keep it in his heart, just as she will keep it in hers. Raven then kisses Wally and says that he keeps telling her that she should take a risk. So there, she took a risk. Now it's his turn. In a flash, Wally runs back, dropping all the implants on the ground. And he asks, like that? And Raven laughs, telling him, like that. Starfire then says that they help each other, and then they can accomplish anything. And Jackson yells, I will never get tired of Space Mom's inspirational sayings. Just then, Goliath comes crashing down as Damien calls out to him, and Raven grabs him out of the air, slowly setting him down. Damien then runs over to Goliath, telling him, You stupid bat! You better be okay! And Starfire asks what happened. Damien tells her that Jorn gave Gar something that he couldn't. And when Starfire asks what, Raven tells him, Love. Back up in the sky, Damien's powder begins to short out Joran's implant, and as he sneezes, Gar rapidly begins to change forms. Soon him and Joran begin to fall to the river below, and as Gar coughs, he asks what happened. Gar then starts to rub his head, stating that he was in some sort of World War II flight simulation, and now his head's all messed up. Joran tells him it's because Robin tried to kill him, and then Gar asks why would he do that, and Joran says that there are two kinds of people in this world, Captain Hooks and Peter Pans. Is there any doubt which one Robin is? Gar then says why is she so angry? And Joran tells him that she'll show him. She hits a button on the projector and that a younger version of Joran appears in a barn. She tells him that when she started building her puppets, it was at first a way for her to escape, and then she realized with puppets she could permanently escape. As the image fades, Gar says, Look, he likes her a lot, but she's hurting other people. She has become like Captain Hook of her own story. Joran looks up and the pirate ship base flies down, and she says that that's their ride. Time to sail the Neverland. The ship lands and she takes Gar's hand and Gar can hear Damien scoff. He looks over and says that he hacked her VR program, didn't he? And Damien tells him her firewall was easily defeated. Just then, a projection of the pirate ship fades and in its place is the T-Jet. Joran looks out the window and says, second star to the right and straight till morning. The next day, Gar visits Joran in the Fresh Start Juvenile Detention Center, but Joran's reaction to his visit is less than desired. She was tricked. She was forced to see an image that didn't exist to get picked up. She stares for a moment and then smiles, reaching back and touching the window. As the day goes on, 
The Teen Titans have a picnic down at the beach and Garth thinks to himself that even though they may have their differences, these are his friends. And with these friends, they're in it together, no matter what comes their way, including Brainiac. With the events that happened during No Justice, many of Earth's heroes confided in themselves to try and piece together what had happened. For Damian Wayne, that meant going to the Lebanese restaurant, Tarbouches, to have some ox blood soup. As Urza sets the bowl down, she tells Damian that they have not seen him in a while, and Damian says that he was out of town. Urza rubs his shoulder, telling him that they missed him, but nevertheless, welcome back home. Damien looks down into the bowl of soup and thinks back to when his mother Talia used to make this often for him growing up. Tarbushas makes it just like she did. This is really the only place that he can somewhat feel at home. Just before Damien begins to eat, he notices a group of shady thugs walk in, and a panicked look comes over Cook Ismal's face. Ismal tries to grab what money he has in the register, but that's not enough, and the men take him into the back. Damien watches, thinking that with no one to protect them as immigrants, they would have no choice but to pay that protection money, but today, that's going to change. In the kitchen, one of the thugs grabs Ismal, and Ismal yells, business has been slow, they can barely stay open. The thug holding Ismal tells him that that's not really their problem. And Damien jumps down behind him, telling him, spoken like a true dirtbag. Before the thugs have a chance to react, Damien grabs one of the pots off the burners and throws the scalding hot soup onto them. Damien whips back, throwing the pot into another man, telling him, don't worry, I have some left for you too. As Damien looks back, he notices smoke, and the remaining thug runs off shooting at him. Damien charges forward, kicking the gunman, and that's when he notices that the smoke is coming from a fire that has been set on a pile of cans containing grease. Seconds later, the restaurant explodes, and even though Urzu managed to get the kids out, Ismal himself wasn't as fortunate. Ismal's sacrifice will not be in vain. Someone will pay for this. A few moments later, the thug who has the hot soup thrown on him wakes up hanging upside down on the side of a building. Damien tells the man that he's not sure how much longer he can hold on to him. And the man shouts, I'll tell you everything, I'm working for Black Mask. Damien tells him, that's impossible. Black Mask is doing time in Arkham. The man shouts back, no! His lawyers got him out on a technicality. Black Mask is bigger than the law. In that moment, something snapped in Damien. He let go of the wire. Maybe it was him still reeling from watching an entire planet be destroyed. Or maybe he just realized his true purpose in life. The man screams to please help him, but just before the man hits the ground, he stopped. Later over at the Gotham bathhouse, Black Mask relaxes in a sauna and then he hears a voice call out to him. He looks back and sees Damien asking him, What is this? The bat sending in the junior squad now? Damien tells him, This has nothing to do with Batman and everything to do with the Lebanese family just trying to live an American life. Black Mask laughs, telling him, It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Unless you got a suicide wish, you better leave before my boys come in and mess you up. Damien tells him, I'm not sure about them. I already gave them the night off. Black Mask reaches for his gun, telling him, It's your lucky day then! It's been a while since I got my hands dirty. As Black Mask leans over, he grabs nothing, and then there's a ch -ch Black Mask looks back to see Damien holding the gun, and he tells him, Batman doesn't use guns! Damien stares at Black Mask right in the eyes, and he tells him, I'm not Batman! And a single shot is fired. But over with another member of the new Teen Titans and the Chinchuli Garden and Glass Museum in Seattle, Amiko. The self-proclaimed Red Arrow is kicked out a window and onto the ground. She rolls to avoid being hit with a set of arrows and she thinks to herself, she's got some real mommy issues. The problem is when they fight, people die. She pulls back on her bow, aimed at her mother Shadow and tells her to just walk away. Shadow says that she knows that she can't do that and Amiko tells her that she will have to take her down then. Shadow holds her arrows pointed at Amiko and says, that worked so well for you in the past. Green arrows made you soft. Amiko releases the arrow and Shadow easily dodges out of the way. She grabs another two arrows and shoots all three down into the lower levels of the building. The arrows break through the glass and Amiko jumps down into the lower floor, shooting the rope holding a banner allowing it to fall. The falling glass is caught by the banner and Amiko knows that the next time she faces her mother, someone is going to get hurt badly. The next night, Amiko dresses up to attend the Seattle Global Exchange Conference on a lead that Shadow's next target will be there. A few days prior, a Chinese diplomat and Australian banker suffered fatal heart attacks. Both were politically well-connected, and two seemingly random people having heart attacks when they were in perfect health, well, it seemed rather odd. It's later discovered that both of them had small cuts caused by an arrow containing a toxin. There's only one person who could use that kind of poison, Shadow. Tonight will be the night to stop Shadow, but not with arrows, words. Amiko steps out onto the balcony where Shadow is, and Shadow asks if she's ever told her the story of her great-grandmother. Amiko says that she told her very little of their family. What does that have to do with anything? Shadow says that Kazumi Adachi was considered the most beautiful woman in all of Japan. Though she was already married and a mother, she caught the eye of the Emperor and became his mistress. The Emperor loved her so much that when the time for war came, he sent her far away to save her. 
as Adachi longs to be reunited with her husband and child, she returned to a port city called Hiroshima. On that day, the most beautiful woman in all of Japan was wiped from this earth. This story is not told to be sentimental. It says how being sentimental will get you killed. Amiko says that she already knows who the next target is. The woman is a mother of three. She's innocent. And Shadow sighs, telling her that she's heard nothing of what she just said. All she has done is brought death into this world until she had her. She loved her daughter like nothing ever before. Shadow hugs Amiko, and after a few moments, Amiko hugs back. Shadow leans back and says that she'll have to make a choice, and she has chosen herself. Goodbye, Amiko. Amiko feels something in her neck, and Shadow holds out an arrowhead with the same poison that killed the two officials. She tosses the arrow back, telling Amiko to make sure that she sends her love to Adachi. Amiko grabs the arrowhead, and she starts to run to the back, but the poison begins to set in faster than expected. She collapses, trying to catch her breath, and she tells herself that she refuses to die like this. She takes the arrowhead, jamming it into a power outlet, shocking her system to stop it from shutting down. She slowly picks herself up and says that she already knows before looking at the outcome. Her mother finished her job and broke her heart. No more second chances ever again. Over with yet another of the new Teen Titans. Kid Flash Wallace West walks down the Santa Monica beach thinking to himself that he's always dreamed of coming to Cali to walk along the shore. It looks so cool in the movies. So here he is. If you can run faster than the speed of light, why not go places that he's always wanted to go? As Wallace skips a rock across the water, he hears an explosion going off in the distance. But before the sound can even fade, Wallace runs over to the pier to find out where it came from. However, what he finds is the people that he was least expecting. The Suicide Squad with Harley Quinn and El Diablo. Harley is also dragging a woman bound in chains. Harley says, Oh, would you look at that, the itty bitty flash! And Wallace shouts, asking, What are you doing to that woman? The woman screams for help, telling him that these people are crazy. And Harley tells her, Oh, no, 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 no! I'm crazy. El Diablo's just dangerous. Wallace quickly runs in, grabbing the woman and freeing her. And Harley asks, Why would you go and do something like that? El Diablo yells, El Stupido. And he begins throwing fireballs at Wallace. As Wallace dodges the first, he's hit by the second, and Harley asks El Diablo if he could be a deer and go fetch their prisoner. El Diablo picks up the chain, asking, Why am I always the one who has to chase him down? Harley tells him it's because she's wearing platform boots and is carrying around a really inefficient but super badass 30 pound mallet. Harley then looks at Wallace and says, Listen up, politically correct Flash, I've got a job to do. Leave Miss Harley to her business. Wallace gets up before Harley can hit him, telling him, You know all about the Suicide Squad. Amanda Waller's our boss. And Harley shouts, Fake news, no such thing! She then pulls out her knife and swings, telling Wallace that he needs to stand still for a second while I stab you. Wallace stops and grabs Harley by the wrist, and then using her free hand, Harley pulls out a gun, putting it to his neck. Before she can pull the trigger, El Diablo calls out that they have a problem. As both Wallace and Harley look back, they see the woman from before is now glowing. Harley says, well, that doesn't look good. And a second later, the woman explodes. Wallace quickly runs and moves all of the people back far enough to avoid being caught in the explosion. On the other side, Wally West, the red-headed one, runs in telling everyone, that he would greatly appreciate it if they all moved back for now. Harley hands Wally her phone, stating that there's papers from the boss lady. He knows the deal. You want to tell the kid how it works? Wallace tells her, yeah, right. You must be dreaming if you think that we're going to. But Wally, the Flash, stops him as he scrolls through the phone, telling Wallace to stand down. Things aren't always so black and white. Harley swipes her phone back, telling him, right, well, we need to be going. And she slaps Wally on the butt, telling him, not a lot of men can pull off spandex. Way to keep it tight. If you ever want to get crazy, just give me a ring-a-ding. Wallace stares and asks what just happened, and Wally tells him that they'll talk. Just not here. Later that night, Wally takes Wallace out to eat, and he tells him, Look, I don't like the idea of the squad any more than you do, but for now, Barry says they get a pass. What the League says goes. Wallace says, Heaven forbid anyone disagree with the Almighty Justice League. Maybe you forgot, but the squad killed my father and my uncle? So why aren't you more upset about a bunch of renegade criminals running around with the government immunity? Wally tells him it's because he's old enough to understand that he doesn't know everything. And there's a lot of gray in what they do. Trust him on this. Barry would do the same. Wallace throws his napkin on the table and Wally calls the waitress over to order dessert, stating that his cousin here will have a serving of humble pie. <laughs> Wallace stands up telling him that that was corny as hell, and Wally tells him that he's a kid. He needs to accept that there's room for improvement, and he's got a lot to learn. Wallace snaps, telling him, It's not what I gotta learn that I'm questioning, it's the people who are trying to teach me. As the two leave the restaurant, Wally asks, What the hell is that supposed to mean? And Wallace tells him, Barry, the Justice League, they're all high and mighty and so full of it. Compromising their own values to let people like the Suicide Squad walk around. Wally says, Whoa, how about a little respect? And Wallace tells him, Sure, when he's earned it. Wally stops and tells him, Look, one day, you're gonna be an adult, and you'll get to make the rules, but for now, you're gonna have to trust and follow our leads. Wallace takes off telling him that that's where he's wrong. He's done compromising, 
and he's not asking for permission. As Wallace heads back to the pier, he thinks working with Damien did have some benefits, like knowing when to place a tracker on El Diablo before leaving. Now all he has to do is follow that signal and get the girl away so that she can have a chance at rehabilitation. As he steps onto a boat where the signal's coming from, he quickly realizes that Harley and El Diablo weren't trying to recruit the girl, it was a hint. Wallace looks at all the blood on the ground and he sees a note left in the fridge stating, You dropped this! XOXO Harley! And below it, Wallace's tracker. He grabs the piece of paper telling himself that he's done listening to the grown-ups. From here on out, he's doing his own thing. And if anyone gets in his way, they're gonna be sorry. But meanwhile, back with our Robin, the guy who's going to be putting this together. In Gotham, Damien looks down at Urza and her family, thinking that starting over was never easy. But it's a necessity to survive. It's not about getting another chance, it's what you do with it. Damien reaches back, grabbing his grappling hook, and he fires a stating that he's seen a way to do this whole hero thing better than his father and his friends. And he can't do it alone. He needs his own team. Not Grayson's hand-me-downs, powerhouses. Ones that are moldable and not so hung up on the rules. It's said that the children are the future. And the future is right now. Once these new Teen Titans are put together, there's gonna be hell to pay. Chanting fills the halls of the Church of Blood as they prepare their offerings for the night. Brother Blood raises his knife, telling the woman that he would like to thank her for her sacrifice. But before the knife could come down, he feels something hit his hand. He turns around and sees Robin call out to his new Teen Titans, Seek and Destroy! The Teen Titans get to work taking out the Church of Blood followers, but Kid Flash notices something. Most of the Church's members are just kids. Kid Flash says that maybe they should focus on Brother Blood and the adult, because they could be taking some sweet pics in the process. But just as Kid Flash goes in for a selfie, his phone is shot with an arrow and he yells, you got a problem with that Hunger Games? Red Arrow pulls back her bow, telling him, you're unfocused and a distraction to the rest of the team. We are here to do a job. Robin calls out over the radio that Brother Blood is making an escape, but Red Arrow readies a shock arrow, stating that she's on it. Red Arrow jumps into the air as she fires, but Brother Blood begins to catch the arrow, telling her, Nice try. Just then, he crushes the arrow, and the electrical shock goes off, stunning him. Down on the floor, Roundhouse bounces up the walls, jumping in to crush his arms, and she asks him, What the hell are you doing? Roundhouse tells her, Well, I just thought with your powers and my good looks, we could make one hell of a team. Crush laughs. Haha, <laughs> you like bowling? Because I'm gonna need you to shut up and roll. She grabs Roundhouse by the nostrils and throws him like a bowling ball into a group of followers. As most of the group is knocked away, Crush follows up, jumping and yelling, Make sure to stay some of the mouth breathers for me! As she lands, one of the followers then runs up from behind with a crowbar hitting her, and it just bends. She tells him, Man, my foster mother always told me that boys have a funny way of showing they like a girl. So if that was a love tap, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not your type! A few moments later, after finishing up in the main hall, Robin, Kid Flash, and Arrow find Crush beating on a magical barrier, and Red Arrow asks, Did Lobo really have to breed? Bad enough there's already one of him. Crush punches away, asking, What is this? And Robin says, It's gotta be Jin. She must have trapped herself in with Brother Blood. Inside of the barrier, Jin is using her powers, telling Brother Blood that she can sense him. His thirst for power leads him astray. Brother Blood grabs her from behind, stating that he can smell the old world magic on her. And even a genie can become a slave like so many others have. As Brother Blood sinks his teeth into Jin, she tells him that he is a creature of habit. Just as she had hoped, this is what the humans call playing possum. And she can promise him that she will never be a slave again. Jin twists her head around, using her powers to pull Brother Blood away, stating, you might be strong, but my power is something even you cannot dream of. Just as Jin begins to exert her power, she hesitates, stating, No, using too much power. Can't let him see. Can't let him find her. Brother Blood grabs her, asking, What is it that would scare something as powerful as you? Just then, Brother Blood hears a voice call out to him, and a roundhouse yells, You're gonna have to unhand her! Roundhouse rockets himself into Brother Blood, freeing Jin. And then Brother Blood looks up, with Robin kicking him in the face. Everyone gathers around and Crush tells them, All right, let's bag this jerk and get out of here. Jin then tells her, Before we go, there's something I saw that Robin might be interested in. Jin points to the three bleeding claw mark carved into the stone. And Roundhouse asks, What's that? Robin tells everyone that that is the other. Every raid that they've conducted over the last month, this symbol has been present. All they know about this person is that they are dangerous and everywhere. Once everyone is taken into the church, Robin flips open a button stating that there is one last thing that they need to do. An epic walk away explosion! Later, at Mercy Hall in Brooklyn, the team winds down for the evening, but Robin is nowhere to be found. It's because he's deep below Mercy Hall in a chamber that the rest of the team doesn't know about. 
This place was used as Batman's safe house, but after some manufactured reports by Robin himself, Batman abandoned it. Mercy Hall serves two purposes. First, it's completely off the grid. And second, it used to be a juvenile delinquent facility. Robin grabs Brother Blood in a room and he asks, What are you doing? Why am I chained up? You're crazy! As Robin closes the vault door to his own personal Black Ops prison, a broken black mask tells him, You have no idea, man. Brother Blood looks around at the other criminals chained to the wall, and Black Mask tells him, Welcome to hell! Now after having the raid on the church end so well, it was time for the Teen Titans to move on to their next target, Gizmo. Gizmo wants everyone to know that he's reformed and he opened up a toy store in Times Square, but the company is a front for his illegal weapons operations. When a shipment comes back as return to the warehouse, everyone wonders why. It's time for everyone to break out and get to work. Crush immediately jumps out of the box and tries to knock Gizmo out of the air, but before she can land a hit, Gizmo blasts her, sending her flying into a stack of boxes. Next up is Kid Flash and Roundhouse, but the second that they get close, Gizmo puts up a barrier blocking them out. Robin and Red Hood watch as the three try to get back up, and Red Arrow says that this is what they get for recruiting YouTube stars and egomaniacs. Robin takes out a small smoke bomb, tossing it, asking, How do you know it wasn't all a part of the plan? As the smoke surrounds Gizmo, Gizmo asks, who the hell are you kids? And Jin phases through telling him, it's not us that you should fear. She reaches out touching Gizmo and as she does, a swarm of bugs begin to crawl all over him and he screams for them to get off. Gizmo begins to swat at the imaginary bugs and Robin throws a battering, knocking Gizmo out of his flyer. Everyone begins to gather around and Robin says, see, it all worked out. Kid Flash picks up Gizmo's body and as he does, the computer announces that the self-destruct protocol has been initiated. Roundhouse looks around at the flashing red lights and he says that he's pretty new to the superhero thing, but this isn't good, right? Robin tells them, picking up Gizmo's body must have triggered the self-destruct. Kid Flash. So Kid Flash throws Gizmo's body down with a thud. Robin then asks, what are you doing? Kid Flash tells him, I thought it might make it stop. Why would Gizmo want to blow up his whole operation anyway? He would die in the process. Robin then tells Crush and Jin to begin clearing out the toy store while he, Kid Flash and Red Arrow deactivate the bomb. Roundhouse then clears his throat, stating, Well, you've forgotten about me. I'll just go roll with the ladies. He hurries into the store and yells to everyone that they have an emergency and everyone needs to leave, except it doesn't work and the kids continue to play with their toys. Crush then says that there's only one thing people understand. And Jin says, Fear. A giant magical dragon claws its way through the store, roaring, sending everyone into a panic. And back in the warehouse, Kid Flash runs through the place looking for the bomb, but he doesn't find anything. Robin kneels down and tells Kid Flash that he couldn't find Gizmo's bomb because Gizmo himself is the bomb. And Kid Flash says, okay, what's our next move? Red Arrow says, perfect. And Kid Flash says, how is it perfect? Gizmo's gonna die. So Red Arrow says, maybe Gizmo should have thought of that before he made himself into a bomb. And Kid Flash tells them, no, there's gotta be another way. So Robin says, well, the other plan is to have Crush throw Gizmo into the sun. Kid Flash shouts, can we think of a plan that doesn't involve Gizmo dying? And just then, Jin returns, stating, I may have an idea. I might be able to help, but it's a little complicated. To use my power in excess wood, Red Arrow says, You can't or you won't. Do something or get the hell out of the way. So Jin tells her, You do not speak to me in that manner. As I was saying, I could possess Gizmo and find out how to stop the bomb. However, for deep magic like that, it can only be performed if commanded. Robin asks, How? And Jin holds up her ring, stating, by a master, one who controls my soul with an object. Some Jin have bottles or pendants, mine is a ring. A ring that was my prison for thousands of years. I swore that I would never let anyone use it or me again. Robin tells her, we are out of options. Either you allow me to use that ring and I don't give it back or Red Arrow's going to shoot him. And Red Arrow says that she would gladly do that. Jin looks at her ring for a moment and then slides it off stating, I trust you with it, Robin. So Robin takes the ring, putting it on his finger. Okay, Jin, possess Gizmo. Jin grabs a hold of Gizmo's head and begins sifting through his memories on the construction of the bomb. And she says that the bomb is nuclear in nature and it's in his jetpack. But if they just try to remove it, it'll trigger the detonation. Robin tells them, we are running out of time. Dig deeper and find a way that doesn't have Gizmo dying. So Jin goes deeper and says that she could see Gizmo wanted his death to be the result of this altercation. With his death, he would lose his physical body and his mind would be uploaded to a digital space that he could live on forever. A few moments later, Jin comes out stating, we can't turn it off. The canister with the bomb in the pack pops out. So Robin tells Kid Flash, I need you, Atlantic Ocean, now! So Kid Flash picks it up and says, I can't. I'm too dehydrated to make that kind of a run, but I got an idea. He rushes outside, tossing Crush the bomb, telling her to throw it. And when she gets ready, 
Roundhouse stops her. He tells her that with the inert wind and weight of it, it won't clear the distance. It's too light. So throw Roundhouse. Crush asks, can you even breathe in space? Roundhouse says, well, we're about to find out, aren't we? So Crush throws Roundhouse into the air, and as the time counts down to one, the bomb explodes. Everyone else begins to come out, and Red Arrow asks, where is Roundhouse? So Kid Flash looks back and points up at the explosion. A week has passed and the team gets ready for the day when Robin sits down telling them that he wasn't ready. He should have known he wasn't ready. Crush, the individual that looks like she could be Lobo's daughter, tells him, well, she was the one who kind of threw the guy into space. She kind of liked him though, in an annoying little brother kind of way. Kid Flash says, that guy is gone. Show some respect. Crush finishes pouring her bowl of cereal, telling him, Roundhouse knew the deal. He wanted to be a hero and for a second he got to be one. Time to move on. Kid Flash knocks the bowl out of Crush's hand, shouting, Move on? It's barely been a week. How could you be so freaking cold? As the two look at each other, Red Arrow throws a knife between them, stating, It was unfortunate what happened, but inevitable. If we're going to work as a team, we need to train as a team to lower the chances of that ever happening again, starting now. So after breakfast, everyone heads out into the courtyard to undergo training from Red Arrow. But as each try, Red Arrow finds everyone's weaknesses exploiting it. The one without any power wins. Crush relies too much on brute force. Jin can be blinded and snared. Kid Flash's feelings can be manipulated into thinking that he actually hurt someone. Red Arrow helps everyone up, telling them that each of them is technically more powerful than her, but they are all undisciplined. They each attacked her one at a time, instead of working together because they assumed their powers would be enough. Crush dusts herself off, asking, if we're supposed to trade as a team, shouldn't Robin be here? And Red Arrow tells her, you can trust that when ready, Robin will be here. Until then, we're going to work together. Deep down in his underground prison though, Robin has been capturing the villains that they defeat, deciding that Batman's plan doesn't work. He needs his own black site prison. And he drops a plate of food for Black Mask, telling him, you're a businessman. How about we make a deal? The trust fund that you have set up for your illegitimate son? What would happen if it suddenly runs dry for him? What happens if his around the clock caregivers stop getting paid? Black Mask struggles against his chain, shouting, Leave my son out of this! And Robin says, The other. I know he's real. Black Mask yells, All there are is stories. Some say he's a man, others say he's a god. Some even say he's the devil himself. Robin walks off eating Black Mask's apple, telling him, I'm not interested in stories. And Black Mask tells him, This one isn't a story. I did hear about a job before getting locked up. Later, at Roosevelt Children's Hospital, the team begins to position themselves as Robin and Jin head inside of the security room. Once the guards are put to sleep, Jin says that she would like to thank him for returning her ring. Sometimes the lingering effects of being able to control someone is intoxicating. But as he puts up a wall to protect himself, she can understand the necessity to do so. So if he ever needs to talk, she's there for him. Robin asks, what exactly would I need to talk about? And Jin says, anything you wish. Red Arrow radios in that they know their comms are open, right? And Crush says, GROSS! Red Arrow then says that team romances never end well. And Crush says, especially ones that involve tiny tyrants. Red Arrow then goes on stating that it doesn't matter who or why, work and personal lives should remain separate. Crush then asks, what if you don't have a personal life? And Red Arrow tells her, abstain. Crush laughs, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a hero, not a nun. And just then, the alert goes off that someone with camouflage just went in. Robin tells Kid Flash to get some recon, but do not engage. Kid Flash zips around the hospital, locating the target, and overhears a girl stating, The deal was nobody gets hurt. We can't do this if... Kid Flash grabs the girl by the arm, stating, From the sounds of it, you don't really want to do this, huh? There's still some time to walk away. But as he says, that golden glider jumps through the wall with a bag full of stolen medical supplies, and Kid Flash asks, Shouldn't you be in Iron Heights? Golden Glider wraps him up, stating, yeah, she should be. But they can't really deal with any heat right now, so take him out, Swerve. Swerve points her gun, stating, he's just a kid, though. But before she could pull the trigger, she's hit with a battering. What part of recon only did you not understand? Golden Glider sighs, stating, we should have taken him out when we had a chance. I'm not going back to prison. See ya, kiddos. As she goes to escape, Swerve grabs a nurse and runs to the top to escape. Everyone rushes out onto the roof with Swerve stating, It wasn't supposed to happen like this. 
I got shot in my third tour and had to get a blood transfusion. The blood that they used must have been meta blood because I got these camouflage powers. After I got back home from risking my life for this country over and over, I had no job or support. I can't sleep. I barely eat. I only agreed to do this so I can pay my damn rent. I don't want to hurt anyone. Red Arrow pulls back on her bow, stating, Bull! And Kid Flash asks, Didn't you hear her? She's a victim in this too! Red Arrow tells him, We all have a choice. Like how she almost killed you before Robin saved your butt. Life is rough for us all. If we let her go and she kills, that's on us. And after what happened to Roundhouse, do you really want more blood on our hands? Red Arrow releases the arrow, pulling the gun from Swerve's hand and knocking her off balance and over the ledge. She then tells Crush and Jin to show them what they got. Crush jumps over the ledge, grabbing onto Swerve, and just before they can hit the ground, Jin creates a pile of flowers to fall onto. Crush asks, Flowers? Really? I hate flowers! Now Jello would have been super cool, Jin. As everyone gets ready to leave, Kid Flash thinks to himself that Red Arrow is right. He does have blood on his hands. That is why, since he was the one who brought Roundhouse to the team, he will be the one to step up and tell Roundhouse his parents. So after the mission completes, he takes a break from all the hero stuff to go there. He knocks on the door to Roundhouse's parents' house in Long Island. The door opens, and Kid Flash sees something he didn't expect to see. Roundhouse. What the? Roundhouse? Roundhouse steps out of the door, eating a chicken wing, telling him, Oh, hey, what's up, man? Gotham City has seen its fair share of crime, and the media is starting to get restless on what the GCPD are planning to do to fight it. The news and the press gather outside the GCPD to ask Commissioner Gordon what he plans to do to fight this never-ending battle. Just before he can give them an answer, though, there's a gunshot and Jim Gordon falls to the ground. Meanwhile, over at the Wu residence in Long Island, Kid Flash is staring at Roundhouse going, You're alive?! Roundhouse bites down on the chicken wing, telling him, Barely. My mom nearly killed me when I went off the grid. She's scarier than that brother blood guy. Kid Flash shouts, How did you survive the nuclear blast? And Roundhouse tells him, Oh, that? It ain't nothing a little igneous theory can't handle. Anyways, come on in before the pop starts tripping that I'm letting all the AC out. We have some kombucha on tap if you... Kid Flash grabs Roundhouse yelling, What the hell, man? We all thought you were dead. This whole time you've been sitting here eating chicken wings and playing video games? Roundhouse presses the button on his suit, turns into a ball to free himself, shouting, Hey! I landed on the other side of the planet and my phone melted. There was no way I was going to be able to contact anyone since half the team hasn't even followed me back on Insta. It's not like anyone would even care. Kid Flash begins to get up stating, well, I did. It really messed me up, man. Roundhouse helps him up and tells him, well, I didn't know. My bad. Kid Flash tells him, yeah, I'm sorry too. Kid Flash begins to pick up some of the furniture that was knocked over by Roundhouse when he finds a picture of Roundhouse and another girl about his age. He asks him, is this your sister? And Roundhouse says, was. Long story. Just before Kid Flash could ask more, though, he gets a distress call from Robin telling him to get to Gotham. Roundhouse asks, is that Robin? Tell him hi for me. So Kid Flash grabs Roundhouse and tells him, you can tell Robin yourself. Within seconds, Kid Flash and Roundhouse make their way into Gotham where they find the police surrounding Gordon's body. The officer tells them to stay back. They have medical on the way, but Kid Flash pushes himself through, stating, there's no time. It'll be faster if... But before Kid Flash could leave, Gordon says, psst. Roundhouse asks, did the guy with the mortal face injury just hiss at us? Gordon smiles, and as his voice changes, Jin says, Ah, Roundhouse, you're not dead. How lovely. Kid Flash says, wait, Jin, you're in Commissioner Gordon's body? And she tells him, of course not. That would be powerful magic. I merely conjured the illusion of his form. Commissioner Gordon was being targeted for an assassination, and Robin thought to make the attempt appear successful. The real Gordon is at home in a deep slumber with the help of a minor spell. Roundhouse then says, maybe we should, like, not be here anymore. There's a lot of reporters, and they might question why we're speaking to the dead guy. Kid Flash runs back into the alleyway so that Jin can change back and asks where the rest of the team is. Jin conjures up a map stating that they're currently tracking the assassin. They are to meet back and rendezvous with the team at this location. So a short while later, across town, Crush looks down from a building stating, This lady, Vic, seems real casual for someone who thinks that they just killed a guy. Red Arrow tells her that some assassins have rituals for when they complete their jobs. Her mother would go get a manicure. Kid Flash and Jin arrive, and just behind them, Roundhouse bounces in, shouting, What's up, players? Everyone runs over with Crush yelling, Hey, you're not dead! Badass! But while everyone is welcoming back Roundhouse, Robin tells them all to be quiet. They're still on a mission. And Roundhouse, where the hell have you been? Kid Flash says, Well, you see, his mom grounded him. And Red Arrow says, Grounded? Are we in kindergarten? Roundhouse tells her, Hey, I'm not sure about your parents, but mine don't play around. As everyone celebrates Roundhouse's return, Lady Vic overhears and makes a break for it. Crush jumps off the building onto a car, and Red Arrow follows, stating, That's not very subtle. Crush tells her, You ain't seen nothing yet. 
and she picks up the smashed car and throws it down the street. As the car comes crashing down, Lady Vic spins her gun back and asks, Do I know you? And Red Arrow kicks the gun from her hand, telling her, I doubt it. Lady Vic pulls out a second gun, stating, You may have some skills, but you're not exactly Superman. She begins to fire, but Crush jumps in the way, telling her, Superman can bite me! I'm Crush. Just then a battering is thrown, disarming Lady Vic's second gun, and Crush grabs her, stating, See? Nothing to worry about. Lady Vic reaches down to the gun on her ankle and fires a shot into the gas that spilled onto the ground from the car that crushed through, setting off a massive explosion. Roundhouse turns himself into a ball, throwing himself into the air to catch Crush, but as Lady Vic gets back up, she takes out another set of guns. While everyone is trying to get to cover, there's a plink sound as a grenade is thrown behind her. Robin yells for her to watch out and throws himself onto the grenade. As he braces for the explosion, it doesn't come. He opens his eyes to look down and see a flower. And Jin tells him that she appreciates the attempt at protection, but she has methods of dealing with these kinds of things. Crush points over at the building, stating that Lady Vic went in there if anyone's interested. We can go in there and... So Robin jumps in front of her, telling her that she isn't the one calling the shots. Her car stunt almost got a lot of people seriously hurt. It doesn't matter how strong she is, if she can't figure out how to be a team player, that she can find a new team. Is that understood? The Teen Titans clear out the building and corner Lady Vic in a room. But as Robin kicks in the door, everyone freezes. Inside, Lady Vic's body hangs from a set of knives that she was stabbed with, and the word boom written across her in the wall. Robin looks closer and sees claw marks on the wall and asks if this is the work of the other. Roundhouse reads boom, asking what that could mean, and it's that very second. The entire building explodes. The blast knocks everyone outside, with Robin beginning to cough as he slowly begins to wake up. He turns on his flashlight with Crush yelling, hey! Unless you want the rest of the building to fall on us, get that flashlight out of my eyes, Bat Kid. Kid Flash starts to get up, but as he moves his leg, he sees a piece of scrap metal lodged in it. Kid Flash says that he should be able to vibrate this thing out, but Robin yells at him not to. The smallest disruption could bring the whole building down. A few moments later, Roundhouse thrusts his arm up, yelling, I'm here! Oh, good. Well, maybe not good. Robin begins to call out for Jin, but after a few minutes, Jin pulls herself out of the debris, stating that she's there, but she regrets that she was unable to protect them all. Robin lets out a sigh of relief, stating all that matters is that you're all okay. And Crush begins to struggle, stating, Yep, doing great over here! You, uh, wanna do something now? Red Arrow tells Jin that maybe they should teleport them out or something. But she tells him she can't. There's limits to her abilities. Red Arrow pauses. What are you talking about? You literally dove into a man's brain the other day. What do you mean you have limits? Jin says that it's complicated. So Red Arrow yells, Either you do it or we die! What's complicated about that? Kid Flash says, Actually, I'm with Arrow on this one. So Robin asks, It's the ring, isn't it? Give it to me. I promise I'll give it back, just like last time. Jin tells him it's not about her ring, it's something else. They don't understand if she uses so much magic so soon. Robin tries to egg her on. Come on, Jin. I thought we... But she screams, No! And the entire building begins to shake. Crush falls down onto her knee, stating, All right, everyone, listen up. I don't really like people, and truth be told, I barely like any of you. But if I drop this building right now, I can tell you for sure who's going to live through it and grab themselves a slice. This girl. Jin's got a secret. So what? She can get mine. Each of us have our secrets. Each of us have our family problems. We're all messed up. Come to the territory. Enough of this BS. Robin got us into this mess. You are sure as hell going to get us out. Silence fills the air, and after a few minutes of thinking, Robin says, Okay, we already did a full sweep of the building. We know no one's inside. Gotham's finest are undoubtedly already on the scene, so we're going to need to find a way to get out without exposing ourselves. There are rats heading somewhere beneath us, likely towards water, which means Gotham's sewers should be right beneath us. If Roundhouse could... And Roundhouse asks, What, get dense? With the best of them. See ya, shorty. Kid Flash says, Okay, sounds like we're going to need some super speed. How the hell am I supposed to run with this piece of metal stuck in me? Red Arrow leans in, smiling, stating, Hey. Kid Flash pauses for a second and says, Wait, you never smile, especially at me. What are you? Just then, she grabs the metal, ripping it out of his leg, with him screaming, Ah, you're crazy! And she tells him, You're welcome. Robin tosses Roundhouse a few explosive charges and tells him to set them at his feet. They aren't going to have much time when they go off. So he sets the charges under a layer of rocks, putting his weight down on them as Red Arrow fires and the arrow sets them off. The explosion begins to go off around them, with Roundhouse focusing his weight onto the weaker parts of the floor, and the team begins to fall through. A hole is blown open in the ceiling of the sewers, with everyone coming crashing down into the water. After pulling themselves out of the sewer, and taking some much-needed showers, everyone begins to relax. Except Red Arrow. 
Inside Jin's room, Red Era lets herself in, telling Jin that she's not sure what the hell is so complicated about her magic, but it endangered everyone. She chose to keep a secret instead of helping the team when they needed her most. She grabs Jin by the arm, telling her, you are going to tell us what the hell is going on right now or you're leaving this team and never coming back. Jin looks back and states, I asked you not to address me in such a manner. Before Red Arrow realizes that she is floating and she feels a pressure at her throat, and in a different kind of voice, Jin tells her, There is something that you don't seem to understand. I have made kings and queens, puppeteered great wars, eradicated empires older than words could record. I do not respond well to threats. If you knew the things that I was truly capable of, we wouldn't be here right now. It is well within my power to make your life worse than nightmares that can haunt a cold heart like yours, Emiko Queen. Red Arrow struggles to gasp for air, and Jin tells her, That's right. I have no secrets from you. So leave. As Red Arrow is thrown into a wall, she finally inhales air that she was gasping for and wakes up in her bed. She looks around asking, Did that really happen? And with no one to answer her, Red Arrow quietly lays back down to bed, unable to get to sleep. Deep below Mercy Hall, the current headquarters of the Teen Titans, there's a smile that comes across Robin's face. This prison that he built, it's dark, it's cold, it smells. Everything a real prison could ever hope to be. But it must remain a secret. Not many could even stomach what it takes to succeed, except for the one person that has learned his secret. Prior to this, Robin led the team on a covert mission to obtain something within the Batcave itself. Roundhouse steps into the giant halls asking if this is really the Batcave. Also, the Batcave is real? Kid Flash tells him, hold up, why are we here? And Robin tells him because they're gonna steal from Batman. My source has been compromised. It's clear the others reach in the criminal underworld may be wider than anticipated. If we're going to fight this, we're gonna have to level the playing field and take Batman's most powerful tool, information. Robin then tells Roundhouse that they're going to need full backdoor access to Batman's computers. While they work on that, he has something else to deal with. Roundhouse begins to get to work, but while everyone crowds around the computer, Crush looks around, noticing Jin is missing. Just then, an alarm goes off, and Red Arrow asks, what did he do? Roundhouse asks, would you believe me if I told you nothing? Meanwhile, upstairs, Robin passes a portrait of Thomas and Martha Wayne, with Alfred stating that he remembers the day that they set for that painting. Welcome home, Master Damien. You should know, Master Bruce spends many a sleepless night thinking of you and your well-being. Robin pulls up his hood, stating, That man barely sleeps anyway. But as he walks away, Alfred stops him, stating, You shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. Robin starts to state, I didn't. And Alfred stops him, telling him, I also don't appreciate someone going through my things. I cannot allow you to leave with what you took. Robin asks, Why are you protecting him? And Alfred tells him, Because Jason is your brother. I'm going to do for him what I would do for any of you. Just then, the alarms reach the main floor, and Robin says, it sounds like you're needed down in the Batcave! Alfred sighs, telling him, Oh, Master Damien, it's being handled. Down in the cave, Roundhouse says, I got good news, I stopped the alarm. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. But that's when from above them, Batman leaps out of the shadows. Back upstairs, Robin tells Alfred to move. Red Hood betrayed me! I'm just doing what Father should have done a long time ago. Alfred tells him, Jason's methods may be unorthodox, but he is a part of his family and on the side of good. Do not presume malice in what is perhaps a miscommunication. Talk to him. Do not make rash decisions that you may regret later. Robin leaves walking down the halls of the Batcave, passing all of the portraits of everyone. When he looks up at the painting of Bruce and all the others, he scoffs, continuing on his way. But behind him, Jin is watching from afar. Down below, Kid Flash runs through the cave, yelling to Batman, You know us! Stop this! Something's not right here! Over by the giant penny, Roundhouse is hiding, praying to God that if he survives, he will limit himself to only playing two, maybe three hours of Fortnite a night if they make it out of here. Batman starts to walk closer when Robin jumps through, cutting off Batman's head. Roundhouse screams as Batman's head bounces on the floor, but then everyone notices the circuitry hanging from the neck. Roundhouse shouts, asking what just happened, and Robin tells him, it's a rare case where Batman wasn't here. There are security measures in place. But when everyone gets ready to leave, Red Arrow asks Jin where she's been the whole time. She thinks about it for a moment and says that she must be mistaken. I was here the whole time, Red Arrow. Back in the current time, our current day, Robin hears his name being called out. And in that moment of not paying attention, Black Mask reaches towards Robin with a makeshift ship. A Red Arrow shoots past him and into Black Mask's hand, and Red Arrow says that she thought they were in this together. That mission they went on, that was a distraction, wasn't it? What were you really doing there? Why keep me in the dark? 
Robin picks up the shiv, telling her, It was a uh, family business. Red Arrow then says that she knew working with Red Hood was a bad idea. He was the one who tipped them off about Gordon, but the other knew they were coming when they went for Lady Vic. So Robin tells her, I know. Trusting Red Hood was an error in my judgment. Red Hood is in league with the other. And Red Arrow says that, or he is the other. As the two head back up to the loft, Robin takes out a small box stating that their mission was to retrieve this. And with it, Red Hood will no longer be a problem. Later that night, Robin follows a stumbling Jason Todd out of a bar. He didn't want to confront him like this, but things need to be taken care of. He sits on a stool next to Red Hood and he tells him, You look like crap. And Red Hood asks, Are you even old enough to be in here, Damien? Robin laughs, stating that the law states that minors can be in businesses that serve alcohol as long as they are accompanied by an adult. So that's you. And we need to talk. Red Hood grabs his beer, telling him, No, we don't. Besides, you're already too late. The old man already found me. Told me what happened to Sanctuary. Red Hood then pulls out a dart and lines up his throw, stating, you better find out who killed Roy, or I will. The dart is thrown and Red Hood says, I was very clear how this works, Damien. You come to me, not the other way around. And Robin tells him, We have a situation. Lady Vic is dead. The other killed Vic before my team could get her. They blew up the whole building with us inside. We barely got out alive. Red Hood asks, Is everyone okay? And Robin tells him, Yeah, but perhaps you were expecting otherwise? Hoped maybe we would all die? Red Hood then asks, What are you talking about? And Robin tells him, Someone knew we were coming, and I know who. It was you. Robin whips his arm back with the dart, stabbing into Red Hood's leg. And Red Hood shouts, asking, Are you crazy or something? A second later, Robin is thrown out of the bar, and as he gets up, he quickly changes into his costume with Red Hood storming out, yelling, What the hell do you think you're doing? Robin jumps up, throwing Batarang, telling him, I know it was a setup. Nobody knew we were trying to stop Lady Vic other than you. You're the one who gave us the mission. Robin starts swinging, but Red Hood catches his arm, stating, Don't do this. Robin then jumps onto Red Hood's back, ripping off his mask, stating, I am going to take you down for good. After an electrically charged hit to the face, Red Hood falls. Robin tells him, Say it. Say you're working with the other. You've got enough of your own sins. You're not going to get me to confess to something I didn't do. Robin then asks, You want to keep playing games? Okay, let's play. He then takes out the small box that he got from the mansion. Red Hood looks up at it, stating, What's in there is my business. It's bigger than this whole crusade. Even Batman wouldn't stoop this low. Robin tells him, Say the truth, now! Red Hood tells him, You want the truth? Now I'm pissed! He smacks the box out of Robin's hand, and as Robin tries to run for it, Red Hood grabs him by the cape, flinging him into a truck. He takes out both his fists, cracking Robin in the back, telling him, I would ditch the cape if I were you. Robin laughs, stating that he's done taking lessons from him. And Red Hood picks him up by the hair, punching him, telling him, Next time, you need to check your facts. You always think you're the smartest one in the room. And there's some truth to that, but you're still just a kid with a lot to learn. Red Hood then finishes with a knee to the face, and as Robin falls, he tells him, Consider this one final lesson. Don't start a fight you can't finish. Robin leans up, opening his vest, showing a bomb, shouting, Even if I lose, I'm gonna win! Red Hood stares up for a moment, and then he smiles. <laughs> nice bluff. We've both been dead once before, but you lost the minute you showed up. I'm not working for the other. In time, you'll understand that. But from here on out, if you and your team come looking, I will put you all into the ground. As Red Hood picks up the box, he leaves. And elsewhere, the other watches. Even later that night at Mercy Hall, Robin tosses in his bed groaning with Jin asking what's wrong. He tells her nothing, and Jin says that she's here to help him. He needs to be honest with himself. So he gets up stating that he just misjudged something, that's all. And Jin tells him, ah, I can see it now. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Robin spins back shouting, I am not! But in doing so, it causes him enough pain to fall to his knees. She kneels beside him, telling him that she can heal his physical wounds, but he needs to let her in. The body and the soul are more connected than he might realize. This requires trust. He swats her hand away, stating, Trust is a commodity I can't afford. I would expect you to understand that more than anyone on this team. She places her hand on his shoulder, telling him that he withholds from the team for the greater good. But his wounds are severe enough that they require attention either from her magic or a physician's hand. So what are his barriers worth to him? Will he maintain them at the cost of his life? He shuffles in the bed, stating that he'll be fine, he just needs rest. As he sits on the bed, Jin says that he had absolute power with her ring and he chose to return it to her. She trusts him. If she heals him, he will need to trust her. That is why she will share with him one of her own secrets, her greatest shame. 4,000 years ago, there was a tale that angels were created from light, and Jin was created from smokeless fire. Her brothers existed before man walked this earth, but she was born in a time of humanity. She is Scylla, a female Jin, rare amongst her kind. 
Shrines were built to her, sacrifices made in her name. It wouldn't be long before she drew the attention of the eldest of them, the most powerful Jin there is and ever was. His name was Elias, and he was the most beautiful thing that she had ever seen. He opened her eyes to the truth of all things, that the Creator made them to be subjugated to the will of humanity, to a life of servitude, not gods, but slaves. Elias taught them that they could fight back, and they did. They fought against those wishing to control them. Eventually, their mission took them to Maka, the mother of all cities. They were there to retrieve the infamous Stone of Souls. It was a stone that was said to have descended from heaven itself. As they prepared for the fight of their lives, they found the stone's protectors were mere children. She refused to kill them, and Elias grew angry. He questioned her loyalty to him and their kind. So she turned and used her magic to stop him, and her other brothers fled with the stone. She cast a protective spell upon the children, but for betraying Elias, she would be punished. Instead of killing her, he did something far worse. He took her ring and made it into a prison. He then commanded her to kill every one of the last children she tried to protect. But her punishment had only begun. He never stopped looking for the stone, and over the thousands of years, he lended her ring to other masters who might help him achieve his goal. But a year ago, the unexpected happened. A young boy stole the ring from his master and gave her back her freedom. Since then, she's had to hide her powers in fear that Elias would come back. Jin looks at Robin and asks, Do you hate me for knowing my secret? He tells her that he's not really in a position to judge. She isn't the only one who's done things that will follow them forever. He's hurt people too, taken lives. But he's always had a choice. She can't blame herself. He then takes off his mask, telling her that she isn't alone. My name is Damien Wayne. And Jin says that it's nice to meet him. As the two begin to get closer to kiss, there's a beep coming from Robin's mask. He looks at the visor, and an image of Deathstroke comes on the lens. Jin asks what's the matter, and the words, Deathstroke escapes Arkham, begin to flash. So he puts on the visor, stating, Everything. Robin can see it in his dreams. He can see his face, Deathstroke, and he's killed everyone. He screams as he wakes up from his nightmare and he tries to wash his face, but he can see Deathstroke's face in the mirror too, and he lashes out, punching the glass. Just then, Jin comes in asking what's wrong. She heard the screaming. She kneels down behind him, asking if it's that man again. Is he sure that he must do this now? Robin looks at the blood dripping from his knuckles. He knows what he must do. He must take down Deathstroke. The next morning, Robin gathers the team together to go over their next target, Slade Wilson, or commonly known as Deathstroke. He is an agent for the other, and this is their chance to finally stop him. Kid Flash says that this just isn't some street level criminal like Gizmo or Black Mask and Red Arrow adds, yeah, but for once Kid Flash is thinking and he's right. We're not ready to handle someone on that level, Robin, not yet. We need more time. But Robin tells them that they don't have more time. Every day can mean another body on the ground. Everyone has gone up against him at one point or another. He nearly killed the original Teen Titans years ago. But it's the same thing every time. Deathstroke somehow walks away. Even when he threw himself into another dimension to try and bring his son back from the dead. The image then changes on the screen to a woman and her daughter. And Robin goes on stating, This is Sophia Evans, eight years old. Her mother was Deathstroke's therapist at Arkham Asylum. She's dead now. This is what Deathstroke does, and I intend on stomping it. But to succeed where the Justice League and the old Teen Titans failed, we must work together. So, later that day in Covington, Georgia, Deathstroke goes to his usual barber shop to get a shave and a cut. The barber, Len, tells me he's right on time. Getting the usual again? Well, have a seat to relax. We'll get you cleaned up. So Deathstroke gets ready to sit, and he tells him, Yeah, relaxing can be deadly in my line of work. Makes you miss things. Like when I walked in, I was told right on time, except it wasn't. Early is on time, and on time is late, Colonel. That's what Len always used to say. Deathstroke then breaks the leg of the man sitting down with the newspaper, and he grabs a Len's arm, throwing him into the mirror. He begins to systematically take down each of the people in the shop, turning all of the gadgets they had prepared against him. As Jin's spell fades, Deathstroke looks at the Teen Titans telling Robin, Just give it up, but I will say you got a set on you, boy. Robin calls out to Crush that she's up, and a second later, she bursts through the wall swinging. Deathstroke easily dodges the attack, telling her that even with all of that strength, everyone has pressure points, just like this. So he pinches a specific spot on Crush's neck. She falls to the ground, asking, What the hell did you do? Roundhouse charges in, shouting for him to get away, but Deathstroke uses a small taser, shorting out the semiconductors in Roundhouse's suit. Kid Flash then runs in, punching Deathstroke to the ground, telling him, STOP HURTING MY FRIENDS! And Deathstroke laughs, you are so predictable. You know that the Icon suit stores energy, right? 
As the charge is released, there's a loud kaboom, and the shock shorts out the conductors in Ranhouse's suit completely, knocking him out. Deathstroke starts to get back up holding a knife, but before he can fully stand, he suddenly falls to the ground. Behind him is Robin, holding a small knife covered in blood, stating that they got him. Red Arrow tells everyone that the cops are on their way, they gotta move out. But Kid Flash says, no, not until I see Deathstroke taken away. And Jin then calls out that there's something wrong with Roundhouse. He can't keep the shape of his body together. Kid Flash runs over shouting that they have to get him into his other suit. as a backup in his room. Are you sure you got this? Robin tells him. Oh yeah, trust me. Deathstroke will make it to his final destination. A short while later, Deathstroke wakes up when he hears the sounds of chains and quiet murmur. He opens his eye to see Robin, and then he lunges, feeling the chains holding him in place. Robin stands over him, smiling, telling him, Welcome to my prison. Today I did what Batman never could. No more cheating the system or getting out of good behavior. The revolving door is closed. Forever. Deathstroke sits back, getting comfortable, asking, Is that so? How is the old man anyway? Have you really thought about this? How this is going to end? Of course you haven't. This is a plan only a child would come up with. The only reason I'm still here is because I want to be here. Robin turns back, shouting, If you're so good, then escape! And Deathstroke tells him, Nah. I'm gonna stay away. Robin then asks, why would you do that? And Deathstroke looks him right in the eyes and states, so that I can fix you. Just then the sound of someone coming can be heard. Robin calls out to Red Arrow, but it isn't Red Arrow. Kid Flash runs through the prison shouting to Robin, what is this place? The next day, Deathstroke is strung up, forced to watch the news of the people that he's murdered. He watches telling himself, this kid, he's gone too far. He struggles to free himself and his son Joseph contacts him asking how he's doing. Deathstroke tells him that he's fine. Robin may have taken his suit, but this isn't something where I couldn't just break my own arm and create enough slack in the cable so that I could get out. As he begins to short out the cell door, Joseph asks, You're not gonna hurt the kids, are you? And Deathstroke says, The only way that they would have gotten this kind of information would be for my own son. So you sold out your father and you're worried about them? Joseph tells him, Actually, yeah, pretty much. You need a pickup? Deathstroke gently pushes open the door, asking, Says, When did I need your help? Meanwhile, in Bronx, Bradley Glenn, the villain known as Black Rock, sits in a hospital with his dying mother in prison. He prays with his mother one last time, kissing her forehead, telling her that he will make him pay for this. Outside, Robin and the team are getting ready to move in to capture Black Rock when suddenly Robin hears a familiar voice over the comms. Red Arrow radios in that they should grab him now, and Robin tells her to wait. Also switch to channel B. The voice says, that's not gonna work. Only you can hear this. Black Rock walks out of the hospital with a bag and his head hung low, and Red Arrow watches, stating, He's not heading to his car? The voice returns, telling Robin, You should have listened to Red Arrow. Your concept is sound, but the system is broken. It's like trying to take out the trash with clean hands. Red Arrow can take the shot right now and put it through his skull. Robin radios to Kid Flash, telling him that he's up. Disarm him now! Kid Flash runs in, grabbing the bag off of Black Rock so he can't activate his suit. But as the bag is removed, it pulls a pin, detonating it. The voice comes back, but this time in Kid Flash's ear. The bag was a decoy. That's why he was carrying it. You have about one second, a lifetime for a speedster. That wasn't a security cable, it was a suicide rig. Too late to save everyone now, but you can outrun it before it's ripped apart. The explosion goes off and Kid Flash shouts to the other, It's him! It's Deathstroke! The blast goes off and Black Rock turns on the suit to protect himself, shouting, you stupid kids! You stupid, stupid, stupid kids! You ruined everything! Robin tells the others that they need to quickly subdue Black Rock while tending to those affected by the blast. Deathstroke tells Robin that he should have taken Black Rock while he was inside. And Robin says, This means that you escaped? Deathstroke brushes his teeth, telling him, Nope. Just tapped into your satellite feed, watching the circus. Crush charges in, but Black Rock punches her in the face, launching her across the garage. Roundhouse screams for Crush, but Deathstroke says that it sounds like it's all falling apart now. Roundhouse is acting emotionally. Even though he knows Lobo's daughter can take the hit, he's not even stopping to wonder why Black Rock is running into the garage. Maybe he left something in his car, but those people trapped, they're gonna have to leave them. Let them die so you can protect the secret. That's discipline. For the greater good, let them die. Deathstroke then heads back to his cell with Black Mask telling him, at last, Deathstroke, our leader, has finally come to bust us out. Together, we will destroy those damned kids. Deathstroke pauses for a moment and then says, Okay, sure. Back at the hospital, Jin starts to lift the rubble, trapping the car, and Black Rock shouts to everyone to just get out of the way. Robin tells him to just give up. He's not escaping, and he asks, Escape? You idiot! 
We've got to save those people, you snot-nosed kids. I was trying to turn myself in. My mother is dying in there, and there's only one man responsible for that. Me. The priest talked me out of suicide, convinced me to go to the cops, and then you punks came along. Once Jin gets everyone to safety, Robin gives the call for everyone to retreat. And later, as Robin heads to Deathstroke's cell, he finds Deathstroke sitting there eating a burger while watching the news. He tells him that he should actually go after the people that he's pissed at. Batman and Ra's al Ghul. Wait, they don't know what you've been up to, do they? Fascinating. Especially after how you handled Blackrock. Sparks from the trapped car ignite the gas line that Jin ruptured when she lifted all of the debris. The only one who could hear that deafening roar was his former protege in slow motion. He had what? 10 milliseconds to save Blackrock? He only needed to extend his speed force aura around Blackrock. Was he following orders or defying them? Maybe you should have let Blackrock die, or maybe not. Either way, you flinched, Robin. Robin asks, What did you mean by you were gonna fix me? How? And Deathstroke tells him, It's simple. You're going to kill. However, the day prior, we return to the moment that Kid Flash learned of Robin's secret prison, the place he's been bringing all of the prisoners that they've been capturing. As the two head up the elevator, Robin says that he shouldn't have seen that. It's not for you. And Kid Flash says that he's sorry for having some questions, like why is every criminal that we've taken down locked up beneath our headquarters? Robin tells him that it's complicated, but Kid Flash tells him, no, it's insane. I put a tracer on Deathstroke to make sure that he went to jail. Turns out, I shouldn't have trusted you! The elevator door dings, and Red Arrow looks in, stating, Great! Kid Flash knows. Spectacular! Kid Flash scoffs, stating, Of course she's a part of this! We're teammates in all of this, and I'm voting that we tell the others about it. Robin tells him, No! There is no prison out there that can hold Deathstroke. Until we figure out what we're gonna do with him, we can't risk telling the others. So a short while later, Robin and Red Arrow train, but all Robin can think about is what Deathstroke said. I'm gonna fix you. Robin throws a battering, cutting the string on Red Arrow's bow and grabs her from behind. He begins to choke her out just as he tried with Deathstroke, but Red Arrow headbutts him asking, what the hell is the matter with you? I know Deathstroke's in your head. I watched the security footage. Are you tempted by his offer? Robin tells her, we were both raised to kill. We both have blood on our hands. And Red Arrow says, of course, but we've broken those patterns, haven't we? Meanwhile, up at the pigeon coop, Crush tends to the birds when Roundhouse comes in asking what's up. She looks over and asks, does he think that Robin and Jin are off somewhere together? And Roundhouse eats his popcorn, stating, who knows? Worst team dating secret ever, right? Crush blushes and looks away, but Roundhouse says, oh, I get it now. You got a thing for Robin. But she laughs, haha, no, not Robin, Jin. Roundhouse then asks, wait, you like girls or something? And Crush tells him, yeah, she does. Roundhouse sighs, oh, you never told us. And then Crush takes the popcorn, stating, you never asked. I thought that Jin might know how I felt, but what if she doesn't feel the same? Roundhouse tells her, you'll just have to deal with it. Trust me, I can reject it all the time. It's no biggie. But you gotta tell her how you feel, because if you don't, well, that's on you. Later, Crush knocks on Jin's door, and Jin answers, stating, it's delightful to see you. Crush shyly looks away, stating, uh, there's something I gotta tell you, and it's, I, I like you. Jin smiles. Well, I like you too. And Crush tells her, it's not like that. I, I like you like... She then just leans in and kisses Jin, but rather than pulling away, Jin accepts it, kissing back. Crush leans back, stating, yeah, so think on that for a minute. As she walks away, Robin returns to see Jin floating there, and he says that he's sorry for being late. But, uh, Jin, are we doing this healing session? He walks in, and Jin snaps out of her daze, and he takes off his mask, stating that he's got a question. In her experience, is killing another human ever justified? She tells him in a particular or dire circumstance, sometimes it's the only way. But her experience has led her to view death differently. Robin looks at himself in the mirror, stating that he died once. And Jin tells him that she knows. It's marked upon his soul. Often death is not the end, but a new beginning. And trust her when she says that there are far worse fates than death. Later in the prison armory, Kid Flash walks in while Red Arrow goes through the pulleys asking how does she do it. All of this. The secrets. The lies they've told. How is she so... cold? Red Arrow says, does he really think that it's that easy? That she wants to do this? He had a normal life before he got his powers. He had choices. Her mother taught her to be one thing. The least that she can do is use what she gave her to stop people like her. They all eventually become their parents at some point, right? Kid Flash tells her, no, we always have choices. I'm not sure I'll ever be like that. Maybe I don't belong here. But as he turns to leave, Red Arrow grabs him stating, wait, your powers alone make you part of the top three on this team. You're also annoying and impulsive. However, you have this exhausting, unfailing moral compass, and even if we don't always follow it, we do need it. 
The team needs you. Kid Flash looks at her asking, team? And Red Arrow pauses and states, yes, the team. Kid Flash, what are you going to do? But down below in the prison, Deathstroke is hanging and he notices someone there. He asks if they're just going to sit in the shadows all night and that's when there's a beep. And that beep was the locks being released on all of the inmates. Back up top, Robin wakes up from another nightmare to clear his head. He decides to go check on his prisoners. But when he opens up the elevator door, all the prisoners lunge out at him. Everyone begins to surround Robin, but as they get close, Robin activates the lockdown, releasing an electrical charge that stuns everyone while hiding under his cape. Blood, Brother Blood gets back up, reaching for the cape, but as he lifts it, Robin has escaped through the hidden hatch beneath the floor. Underneath, Deathstroke grabs him as everyone begins shooting below and gets away. Deathstroke then throws Robin out the other end, telling him, Looks like you got a little shrapnel in your eye during the electric slide. Better get that looked at. Also, while you were gone, I implemented your secret Terminus protocol from your encrypted server. You're welcome. Just tell everyone to stand down. Robin asks, Terminus? No. And he lunges, swinging at Deathstroke. He aimlessly swings, with Deathstroke catching the knife, asking, What's wrong? I just solved your problem for you. Stop! Deathstroke grabs Robin, pinning him back, holding a knife to his face, with Robin shouting, Do it! You know you want to! Deathstroke tells him, no, what I want to do is know why you hate me so much. Why is this so personal? So personal you're willing to get the other five kids killed. Robin tells him, you could go straight to hell. And Deathstroke tells him, fine, sounds like a plan. Good luck out there with Paw Patrol. You're going to need it. Outside, Kid Flash talks on the phone, and when he turns back, he sees all of the prisoners about to walk right out the front door. Swerve runs for the exit, but before she can make it, the doors are locked, trapping them inside. Kid Flash runs up the walls and into Red Arrow's room, telling her that they got a problem. Robin's lockdown still isn't a drill. Seconds later, Crush is blown out of her room by Atomic Skull, but she charges back, punching him through the wall and into Brother Blood. While that is going on, Robin makes his way to an opening and sees Kid Flash standing there, waiting for him. He grabbed all of the collars like he asked in the text. So Robin gets up telling him to get those over to Red Arrow. She'll know what to do. He'll deal with Deathstroke alone. And Kid Flood then asks, What did he do to you? Robin looks away. Nothing. Everything. His arrogance, his impunity, just rubbing our faces with his evil. His smug, arrogant, and Kid Flash says, whoa, 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 whoa. You took on the world's deadliest assassin, dragged us into this because some guy ruffled your hair? Robin climbs the ladder telling him, that's ridiculous. And Kid Flash tells him, no, you're fixated on it. Like, like it's a trigger. Kid Flash then jumps in his way asking, who are you really mad at here? Who is Deathstroke standing in for? You can't take out the real guy, so your world is about Deathstroke. This prison, where you kidnap people, it's like we're the criminals here. We just lock people up and forget about them. Robin tells him, you have to hurry. If people die, it'll get even worse. So I suggest you get on with it. Kid Flash races over to put the power dampeners on all of the prisoners, with Red Arrow telling him that they need to bring him downstairs. Crush shouts asking what the hell is going on? How did the losers get here? And what did she hear about a prison? What the hell is her and Bird Boy not telling them? Robin hurries over to the jet where Swerve's last known location was, and she points her guns telling Robin, please leave, please let her go. Robin begins going through the jet's cabin as telling her that he can't do that. But that's when Jin phases in asking, what is she talking about? Robin tells her, there's no time. Get these injectors below, fast! If we let them go, if they leave, they're going to die. Swerve asks, what did you do to us? Infect us with some kind of a virus, a failsafe, in case the prisoners escaped? Robin says, There's an enzyme in the prison oxygen that inhibits the toxin. Outside the prison, the air is poison. That's right. Robin then rushes to the outside where Deathstroke waits for him, telling him that the Terminus protocol was brilliant. But he kept it a secret because he was too weak to implement it. So he did. Robin tells him, That's right. I infected the prisoners. Release them. Let them walk out the door and die. It's that simple. Deathstroke asks, Release them? I wouldn't cross the hall to spit on them, letting them go as if they were my kids. You risked your life to save people who are actively trying to kill you. I turned on the Terminus to fix you, but it's too late. Robin asks, is it? Would you bet your life on it? And Deathstroke takes off his mask telling him, yeah, I would. I couldn't understand the obsession, figured it was bats, but that's not it. There's something else, deep. And Robin tells him, you don't know anything. And Deathstroke hands out a gun telling him, I know this. I said I was going to fix you. It's only one way. So do it. 
You know you want to. Robin takes the gun. He takes aim at Deathstroke. He holds it steady, and he doesn't pull the trigger. Deathstroke tells him, that's what I thought. Bats ruined you. Yeah. Then there's a quiet thunk as a red arrow shoots into Deathstroke's false eye. He stands there for a moment, and then he falls to the ground. The next morning, Red Arrow washes the blood off the roof, and Robin, along with Kid Flash, says that they need to talk. Red Arrow tells them that they know that if he'd escaped, he'd have killed again. It would have been on their shoulders. But just then, Roundhouse shouts, Hey, jerks! You lied to us! I expected this kind of crap from the Psycho Twins. But KF? We're supposed to be friends, man! You met my mother for dinner! Everyone begins to argue, and through it all, Jin quietly says that they must release the prisoner. Kid Flash then says that she's right. They do have to release them. They should have the moment they found out. Red Arrow tells them that it might be hard for them to understand, but those prisoners are the key to taking down the other. Those criminals are his agents. Kid Flash then asks, where has that gotten us? Face it, that prison is nothing more than a ticking time bomb that's already almost gotten us killed. Red Arrow pulls back on her bow, aiming it at Kid Flash, stating, she can't let him go. And Kid Flash asks, what are you gonna do? Put an arrow in me like Deathstroke? So Red Arrow shouts that Deathstroke was a monster. She just did what he didn't have the guts to do. If he's so righteous, why didn't he stop the arrow? He's faster than it, right? Maybe deep down he wanted Deathstroke dead as well. So you're welcome. Robin steps in telling her at Arrow that she crossed a line that never should have been crossed. Now you have to live with it. Kid Flash says no. She made a choice that we all have to live with. Just like you and your damn prison. But not anymore. Kid Flash reaches for the door, but Robin throws a battering into it, telling him, Just listen! Deathstroke activated Terminus. I never intended on... But Kid Flash stops him, Yeah, you weren't gonna kill them, but you weren't gonna free them either. You've done something that Flash, Green Arrow, and even Batman would never do. They were building a better system. Theirs was systematically built. If you can't see that, then we're a part of the problem. Jin says that she understands. He thinks that she is part of the problem. Robin tries to tell her no, but she says... You let me in. I shared my history with you, my greatest shames. I believed you understood me, but it is clear now that you are not who I thought you were. What you are doing is disgusting, inhumane. It is one thing to take someone's life, but to take their freedom, that is evil. Robin tells her that he's going to do this for the greater good, but Jin stops him, stating, that is exactly what Elias said before he took my ring and imprisoned me within it. Robin shouts, they're criminals! They chose to be cold-blooded murderers! You just saw it! They tried to kill us the second they were free! I'm the leader of this team, and sometimes the leader has to make hard decisions. Jin sighs, stating that she is more lost now than she was the day he found her. Roundhouse then asks if they're going to do this or what. And Jin says, yeah, they are. So she begins to fly away. Robin reaches out for her, but she pulls away, stating, do not touch her. Robin tells her to stop, but when he goes again, Crush grabs and lifts him up, asking, are you deaf? She said don't touch her! Crush then throws Robin's body up against a billboard, and when Kid Flash tells her not to, she elbows him, launching him across the roof. Crush then turns to Red Arrow, but before she can do anything, Kid Flash runs around Crush with enough speed to pick her up and throw her down the roof. Roundhouse charges up, bouncing into Kid Flash, shouting that he needs to quit being such an ass! And Red Arrow sighs, stating that this is ridiculous. Jit agrees. They should be releasing the prisoners. So she pulls back on her bow, stating that they are not going to do that. Jin waves her hand, disarming her, stating that all the arrows in the world cannot stop her. Red Arrow then tackles into her, telling her that she's probably right. But then again, there's no need for them. The six continue to fight amongst themselves, but Jin stops everyone with her magic, stating that they will stop the senseless fighting immediately. Or she will. Robin gets back up, stating, The prison was my idea. It's my burden to deal with. And Kid Flash tells him that that's the problem. He's always been making decisions for the rest of them. But that ends with... Before he could finish his loud explosion, knocking everyone to the ground. Crush pulls herself up, asking, who the? But before she could finish, a hand reaches down, picking her up by her neck, and she says, you! Lobo laughs, ha ha ha, that's right, sweetheart, daddy's home. And there you have it, the full story of the Teen Titans Rebirth Deathstroke Saga. Uh, I probably didn't put Aqualad in the title because no one really cares about Aqualad, honestly. There are fans for him, I'm not going to lie, but just not nearly as many as Deathstroke. So I probably put Deathstroke Saga in the title for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed this. We're going to be bringing you another Teen Titans full story in a couple of weeks. It's going to be the End of Robin arc, which is basically going to be the finale for Robin and how we lead into Future Perfect. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Storm.